This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Jumbo Jumbo and hello, hello everybody. A very warm welcome to our sunrise drive. We are in the Maasimara of Kenya and we got some Jaco Pups. My name is David. Welcome aboard to your very own safari, live from the African bush. I do not know what these jackal pups are foraging there on the ground or they are picking any small little bits of insects they can eat in this very cold morning of the Maasai Mara of 17 degrees Celsius or 62 degrees Fahrenheit. These jackal pups are three currently. I got two there on the road, but there's one that's hiding somewhere in the grass. I've been following them for quite some time and I've found out they got a den, which is right there. But I'm going to be showing you the den much later on. And one more time, welcome. Good morning, everyone. And warm welcome. My name is David. And coming with me is Bungay. Jackals will have anything between one to nine pups, depending on the mother whether she's giving her litter for the first time, second time, or third time. But of course, as they get older, they give birth to more pups. Remember, we came into you live, as I told you earlier, and we would love to hear from you. Please send through questions or comments to hashtag World Earth on Twitter or at FC in the comment section of the YouTube chat channels. For the young ones, you may do the same by sending us emails, kids questions at worldearth.tv. Now they must be seeing, smelling something that they are liking there, because I'm just seeing soil and maybe some poop of some young elephant or some sort. You see that dark soil there where that one is? To me, it looks like some dung, very loose dung, maybe of a buffalo. But she's interested in it. Not sure what she, she's getting in it. But it's definitely something that she is enjoying. Beautiful light. Very calm. The parents are not there. I haven't gotten the parents or the mother. Just the jackal pups on their own. Playful, as most of the pups will be early in the morning full of energy because at night they spend the night in the den so I'm imagining they got lots of energy now Sky I agree with you you are saying Jaco Pups is a good way to start the day thank you Sky and should you have other questions Sky please send them through and maybe this Sky could be a good beginning for the Sunray Safari, the whole of Africa. It's the third Jaco pup that has come up, and this is the silver-backed Jaco, and sometimes we also call them the black-backed Jacos. A friend of mine the other day uh, helped me to clarify, we got two species of Jacos uh, in Africa, this one here, the black-backed Jaco, and the other one, that's called the striped uh, Jaco, and the third one that I thought you know, or we've been calling a jackal, the golden jackal, is now the African wolf. African golden wolf. A friend of mine called Joy helped me remember that, that since then, IUCN has changed that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not the only one that will be coming to you live. We have other locations in Africa.
I am so envious that you get to see jackal pups. It was one of my favorite things to follow in the Mara. But guess what? We've got my ultimate African animal, which is, of course, this beautiful gray giant, which is an elephant with the sun rising just over his head. My name is Tim McCurdy. The camera with me today is Odie, as usual, and we are bringing you this live safari from Providence, which is part of Paluli Game Reserve and also part of the great Kruger ecosystem. This is an elephant that we actually see quite regularly. He's fairly young. And now you're probably thinking, that's ridiculous, you can't tell elephants apart, but, but I can. And, the, and this guy in particular has got a little hole in his right ear, which you might be able to see, maybe not because of the branches, could be obstructing your view, but you can see that. But also, he tends to hang around on his own a little bit. He can't quite keep up with the rest of the herd, and that's because there is some issue with one of his hind legs. And if he does start moving around, you'll see that it's actually shorter uh, than the other one. So it's his back left leg. You can sort of see uh, because it's hidden. But um, we've been discussing a number of different reasons as to what could have happened. But of course, none of us are vets. None of us were there. And I think you'd need to probably have an x-ray of this animal to really determine the cause uh, of his injury. But he carries on. And just to give you an update in case you missed his history, look at him there. I was actually told that he was seen last year in Thornybush, still with his herd. And now he has separated from them and gone on his own way. But powerful creatures, I'm sure you saw that beautiful silhouette as this elephant just pushed that, uh, what was once a bush willow, over. He looks like he's looking for something specific. What are you feeding on? He's going after some sort of small twigs, perhaps from the round leaf teak, but it's hard to sort of say. And he's just popping them in his mouth. But he's so close to us and he's so relaxed. We're really, really spoiled for elephant sightings in this area. We can't say that these animals are relaxed all the time, but eight times out of ten, they're quite happy to keep you company as you sit and watch them. And I'm actually just going to sit quiet for just a minute because the birds have also just woken up. Now, hopefully you were able to hear all the birds tweeting away but then i'm sure you heard that funny rumble i promise it wasn't odie or i but that was the elephant in front of you <laughs> how cool is that now i wonder if he is chatting to maybe he's talking to the other elephants they're not too far away from here there's a small bachelor herd that's just sort of to the west of where we're sitting And I think he's just making sure that he doesn't get left behind. There's another big bull that has been seen hanging around with this lot. Not our usual friend, Kumo, but a fellow with one big tusk. So I'm hoping to see him as well. So we will see if these Ellies end up at Nglovu Dam a little bit later. Now, Pile, fantastic question from you this morning. Um, elephants don't have terrible eyesight. Unfortunately, and the elephants and rhinos aren't able to see. But I promise you, their, their eyesight is not as bad as what you think. Rhinos are a little bit worse off. But I would say an elephant sort of sees quite similar to humans, except they don't really see in color. They sort of see in, in shades of gray, if you can imagine that. So kind of like how the bush looks right now, <laughs> those sorts of colors. Um, so they, they, they can see fairly well. They don't see as well as something like a lion or a leopard that's eye is specifically uh, designed to pick up even just the smallest amounts of movement and also to be able to utilize them in low light conditions. Elephants' eyesight, of course, just like ours, will deteriorate as the light starts to fade. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Masai Mara. We have a herd of buffaloes resting here. My name is Tim, and behind camera we have Big James. Now right here, look at how lovely and warm it is. Getting sunny. We have buffaloes resting. Seems like they had a busy night feeding. Now buffaloes will take turns in the night sleeping and feeding, and even take an advantage of a waterhole where they go and drink. 
Now, they'll still be resting here until mid-morning where they continue feeding and then take to a water hole. Now, these are big herbivores, so they eat a lot of grass, meaning they're bulk grazers. So they need to drink water on a regular basis. Now, we have cattle egrets also accompanying them. So these cattle egrets take an advantage of insects or vertebrates disturbed when these herbivores are browsing, or feeding, and walking. We also have some other birds called the oxpeckers. Oxpeckers play a symbiotic relationship between the herbivores because one, they'll clean up the, and eat the ticks that are on the body or the other parasites, and also sometimes they warn the herbivores for pred predators when they're coming around. Now, we have that young bull there. Sometimes this bull play an important role because they'll be sentinel watching over if there's a predator coming around. Look at the ox pecker right into his ear. Sometimes they can be disturbing, but it's a good thing to see when they're feeding on this, on the skin of this herbivores. But sometimes they don't only eat the ticks, but sometimes they even get into the wounds and suck blood. Sometimes they can be irritating. That's why you see the buffalo is not happy about it. Now, we have other people in the vicinity. That's why the buffalo is curious. We have, there's a moving car. That's why the buffalo is watching there. Then some of them are still curious. Look at them, they, they have a very sharp eyesight sometimes. They also produce a lot of mucus, which also, which the mucus helps them to sniff or to smell from a long distance. So buffaloes, even though they've not seen a predator, sometimes they get to get the scent from smelling from a long, long distance away. Good morning everybody, good morning here at Juma Private Game Reserve in Service Sands and now sitting with Lambra again in this chill morning, what, not really chill morning but very good temperatures, 19 degrees, 66 Fahrenheit, so it should be really cool. And my name's Andrew, on camera, Neil this morning, so we visit the same spot as we were yesterday and Talamba is still around. So I believe that she actually had a, her last or her second kill that she had a stole from the, this is actually the kill that she has stole from the hyena. And then I'm pretty much sure that the kill that she had, her, you know, her regular kill, is probably done, they probably finished. I'm not sure nobody check. We'll actually go there, have a look. You found that maybe she just switched because here, water hole close by to that the second kill so but once we investigate that and it will know what happened but if she finished that wouldn't really surprise me yesterday afternoon when we left her you know she was still busy feeding in a tree so it could happen that she she just finished all things and what we saw in that the second kill that she stole from the hyena Still a little bit of a meat, which she will be around probably the whole day today. Let's see how she just take it easy day. Mali, welcome to the show. You want to know how often do leopards hunt? So leopards, leopards were more especially uh, well, first thing I see in leopard you know, kill two prey, you know, around, I mean, close by. So what happened, that leopard, you know, made a kill, uh, you know, first kill, and then a second kill was made right close by to that tree. And then what she does, actually, she hosted in the very same tree, and then that makes sense, that leopard, leopard a lot of time, you know, they, since I don't know when is the next meal, so they hunt regularly, and they hunt every day. 
when they're hungry, but when they have a kill, you know, they just chill. But anything come across there, and they were able to, very much interested to hunt and kill if it's possible. You know, leopard wouldn't mind, you know, killing the different brave species, but put it in the same tree or different tree for that, since they're not too sure when the next meal will be available. But you know, sometimes they can go for three days without properly, four days without properly meal, when I'm saying not proper meal, it's because maybe they, you know, they rely on birds, lizards and everything, but that doesn't really make them full. So yeah, they, they hunt, they had to hunt regularly, every day if they, they, they got nothing on them. And then you find, you know, during the day when it's hot, you still find the leopard, I mean, a move, trying to hunt. You see that leopard, it's really starving, you know. And that's all they need to do is to go through these tall grasses, you know, hoping to get, or they can scavenge as well. If there's a kill on the ground, and they just go scavenge and put it up in a tree or steal from the smallest cat, they can steal from Seval, they can steal from Caracol. So, you know, this is how they, they get around here, this is how they survive. Get her tummy. Look at this pattern. You now we we're talking about a rosette spot around this body of the animal. But if you check on the bottom there, it's a black spot and it's a lot of white and it's very hairy as well. So I'm going to take a moment here stick with this cat. Well, that's very true, uh, Andrew, and congratulations for sporting leopard. And I think it was uh, Sky who said it could be a great day to start a safari with the jackal pups. And now, we got a leopard. Beautiful. I thought I'm going to spend a few more minutes here before I leave these pups because they are full of action, very busy, playing, trying to sniff anything they can get. Of course, definitely they are not hunting. They wouldn't be able to hunt until they're about six months old. And my guess is they're slightly over two months. And like many small Animals, when they're born, be it of predators, they're born blind, and the eyes do not open until they're about eight, ten days. And it's after three weeks, so they'll always come out of the den. Rick, that's a very good question. You're asking what prey do they hunt the most in the Mara? Rick, I'll tell you. Once in a while, you'll see the jackals scavenging, just like the hyenas. You see them going to kills of uh, lions, or cheetahs, or leopards. But these pups, once grown, they're very good hunters. We have seen them. Sorry about the vehicle coming in the shot there. But we have seen them going hunting lambs of impalas, baby Thompsons. But more often than not, you'll always get them in the ground uh, looking. Oops. Sorry about that. Looking for eggs of ground nesters, like lapwings, or chicks uh, of the same ground nesters. But lambs of uh, impalas, they're very good hunters for the same. Now, earlier I was talking about the three species we have heard of jackals uh, here in Africa, and I said we go to the black-backed jackal, or this one here, or what sometimes we call the silver-backed jackal. And then I said we've got a second one called the, uh, the side-striped jackal, and I talked of a third one that is called the golden jackal. But since the International Union for Conservation of Nature did a bit of research and have confirmed the golden jackal actually is not a jackal, but it's a wolf, and we're calling it the African golden wolf. So I would say we've got two species of jackals here, 
this one and the side striped jackals and the third one is a wolf now called the African golden wolf. I'm going to give you one more chance to see these pups here before I move on to look for something else because they give me so much joy to see them back in the den, the Tamil Mount. So I thank uh, my friend Joy who helped me with that new information. And after another two or three minutes, I'll be leaving this jackals playing and I'll move on possibly to look for some lions. And I'm sure you'll find all the lions in the Mara. We're still with the elephants. We've actually just repositioned slightly because we found some bigger tuskers. So we looked at the younger elephant bull, who's probably anywhere between, I would say, 16 and 18 years old. And now this fella is slightly taller and he's got much, much bigger tusks. And this is indeed the same bachelor herd of elephants with a, the elephant that we're telling you about that has the one tusk. So I'm hoping that we will see him. He's just hiding away for the moment. But something that I thought was quite interesting for you to see is from this angle, he's invisible, hey, behind all those trees. So if you ever thought that an elephant can't hide away, seen as though they're the largest land mammal, mammal you were wrong. Well, at least they can hide away from me. Most animals do that quite well. but that um, <laughs> camouflage against all the sort of trees that have lost their leaves and the yellow grass. You don't need much vegetation between them, so you've always got to be very careful while you're out here, especially if you're on bushwalk. Remember, we were just talking about um, elephants' eyes and how well they can see. Well, we as humans, we don't have the best eyesight either, so we need to use a combination of our senses, just like the animals. So elephants have a keen sense of smell and great hearing. Uh, our sense of smell, not so great, but we do rely on our hearing when we are out in the bush. You can see a few specks of bright green. Looks like it's actually coming from a bushman's grape that was just growing there. That's what those bright green things are. But that bull that we're looking at now is the elephant with just one tusk. Now, he hasn't got enormous tusks, but he is huge in stature. And our favorite big elephant bull that we see on Pridens. Pridens, well, there's a couple, um, but Kumo is one that we see almost every single day. He used to have a, a GPS tracking collar on him, um, and it's research that's going to the project called Elephants Alive, but he managed to break it, <laughs> and it fell off, and I had to go and collect it. So now we, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit difficult to tell who he is, but this bull, yeah, supposedly gave Kumo a bit of a hiding. And I thought it was going to be quite tough to get bigger than Kumo. There is one elephant that's enormous that roams around here. His name is Izzelwini, but he is an enormous tusker we haven't seen for a while. So I'm very excited to get to know this fellow with one tusk who's been chasing my favorite elephant around. So, guys, look what we come across. Now, we, we tried to follow the Ominos yesterday evening. They seemed like they were out and about trying to do something, maybe going for a hunt. Now, this area was a one place that had lots of wildebeest and buffaloes. They seemed hungry. They didn't hunt in a three consecutive days. But then, I think not long ago from now, they had come across this wildebeest. How lucky. She's starting now to devour from the hind legs. The rest of the lionesses, because there are only three in the Owinos, are about to join not long from now. Now, I think she's the one that did the hunt. We've seen her drag the carcass up to here. This is the first time she's devouring. See, she's going to the softer tissue the hind legs which lions typically do they start from the groin all the way to the softer tissues in the stomach and then they start devouring the entire carcass now this is not a fully grown wildebeest it's a young one a calf but not fully mature which will at least sustain them for a little while before they get another male i was quite happy when I saw this guy because yesterday they seemed to be very very hungry 
and they were looking, walking around, searching everywhere and starting, trying to flush out anything they could see in the bushes. Now, since there's not much going around here, she will at least eat some part and then when it warms up, they'll try and drag it somewhere where they can get the meal until they devour and finish it. Now, lionesses play a vital role in the success rate of the pride. They're the ones who do the hunting. So, yesterday we had a male by the name of Blondie who was following these lionesses. And because he was not welcome, one of the alpha females that will soon join this lioness was keeping an eye and trying to keep Blondie off from following them simply because he knew that this lioness was up to something, trying to get something to eat. So the reason why he was following. Now, how much food or how much meal that can a lioness take in one go? It's reckoned that lionesses can take about 20 or 25 kilos of food at a sitting, while the males take about 35 kilos of food at a sitting. Now, look careful. The, lion the other lionesses are calling. That's why she's looking to that direction. They're almost joining in. So, typical of how she will be eating, she will eat as because she already had the hunt. So she'll eat and at least try to rest. Look at the blood in her face. Shows you that this is still a fresh carcass. Now when the other lionesses will join in, she will definitely accept and they will all be eating. Lego, thank you for your question. How many lions can this wildebeest feed? Now, it seems like a small wildebeest, then it can only feed about four to five lions. But if, it, if there was a male in here or within the pride, then the lion will go fast, of course, eating almost the entire. So I'll say if there was a male, it will only take like about three, three lions. So this meal is only equal of enough for about four lions. Now this lioness has an advantage because it's still cool and the vultures are not yet warm enough. They've not picked the thermals yet to soar up in the air to find something to eat. An indication that sometimes might attract predators like the hyenas and sometimes other lions. If there's some lions within this area, especially, especially the, we call them the marauding lions, the ones that have been kicked out of the territory, they take advantage, they're opportunistic, who will come to join in and sometimes kick off these lions and take over the meal. Very well done, team, and you better stay there. And I still want to uh, mention Sky, who said starting the day with Jacob Pups, it could be a sign of good things. Now, the Jacob Pups, the leopard, lions having breakfast. Beautiful. But now I just want to ask a question. I got a raptor right there facing the other way, and I'd be happy to know which raptor do we have on the screen. Hashtag World Earth at FC in the comment section of the YouTube chat channels. Please let the director know. We'll definitely then tell David which raptor do we have touched on that shepherd tree. Thank you for turning. She's giving away her characteristics. 
all ID signs that you need uh, right there. Look at the beak, hooked. Small little crest, very small. But I'm sure you all know it's an eagle from that shape of a beak. But what eagle are we looking at here? Yesterday morning on the drive, we saw a tiny eagle that was eating a very special a prey. I don't want to say what prey it was for those who are not with us. I don't give away the answer of this particular one. Lima, you say macho eagle. Not bad, Lima, but not bad, but not quite what I'm looking for. It's an eagle, and it'll give you a 70% of just calling it an eagle. Very good. But it's not macho eagle. And I'm sure. Uh, having ruled out the martial ego, I'm trying to imagine uh, Jared in the final control director in the show this morning will be getting an answer very quickly. It was very special to see uh, a Tony ego yeah, yesterday morning tearing down, I would say, a very special prayer that I haven't seen a Tony ego do that in a very long time. Sandy, very well done, Sandy. Congratulations, 100%. Asante Sana. And you see the black chested snake eagle. Very well done, Sandy, correct? That's the black chested snake eagle. And I'm imagining she's just there scanning to see any sign of maybe a snake moving. Now, Sandy and all other nice people, yesterday morning we saw a Tony eagle that hunted an African rock python. That was very special. We didn't see the hunt, but I saw her fly to a shepherd's tree like this one here, which of course had all the leaves, and she devoured that rock python completely. And after she left late in the day because it was free, I just passed under that tree, she was gone, and I carefully examined anything she might have dropped there. And I saw a skin of an African rock python. Well, I'll have to move on. And as I said earlier, I'll either be looking for lions. If we don't see lions, I'll be looking for my baby elephant, Jasiri. So we're still here with Lamba, the princess. And she's now head up. And I'm just gonna go to that like, kill, that just the remain of that kill she stole from Aina. And then from here we can get a little bit of a visual of what's in there. So you can see that also looks like it's probably stalling trying to go for it. And then she, I don't think she noticed that because otherwise she wouldn't like that. She wouldn't like anybody to go in and near her kill. Stalling is a very small bird anyway. They can pick as much as they want silently. And then she won't notice until she look back into that tree. And then the sun is actually coming out beautifully. There was a visual of hyena on her right inside of her. And just behind that to the more right, right there. That's a young hyena just pop out there. And maybe that's why she was looking in that direction always. So she still have her enemy around here. Yeah? I'm gonna sit in this sighting here, yeah, see what is happening. Good morning and welcome to Anbion Gala, where we've had quite a, a beautiful morning so far. We watched a lovely sunset this morning and then we decided to find you a lion of a different kind. So what I'm currently holding in my hand is called an ant lion and it is part of the little or the small five. Not one you often see, you usually see the little um, conical pits that they create to trap and catch ants or, or other small insects. Excuse how dirty my hands are. 
He's climbing up my hand, moving backwards as they do. My name is Marna and with me behind the, c the camera is Gert. So I really felt like a kid this morning catching this little thing. I used to do this when I was when I was younger. We would always try and fish them out with a what, like with a little piece of grass. So we would act like like an ant falling into this little pit, and then you would see them throwing up sand, trying to get that ant covered. So they go to the center of the pit, and then they lie waiting at the bottom. So they've got these these two. I don't know if you can see it. Sorry, Gert. But they've got these two big, almost like pincer-like mandibles in the front. Um, and that's what they would drag the ant um, with. Oh, there he goes, there he goes. I need to catch him again. But they would take it under under the sand and then they would feed on it under under there. So quite a quite an interesting little insect. I just need to find him again. All right, I'm gonna put him back and then we'll see what else we can find this morning. Now from the ant lion lava to the lion itself, we have one of the Owino lionesses. She's slowly devouring our wildebeest carcass. She hunted not long ago, I reckon about an hour or maybe half an hour ago. So the rest of the sisters are not joined in. We can hear them calling or maybe giving a soft, low roar from a distance. Now look at how she is eating. She began fast with the hind hindquarters or the groin which is more softer the inner softer tissues which is how the typical how lions start devouring since this will be is young then the tissues are still tender and soft now look at the inter intestine now predators don't eat the inner tissues or maybe the intestine because it has a lot of plant matter grass matter so she will eat, eat the softer tissue, the rib cage, or something got her attention. Because at this time, being alone, predators can come in, especially hyenas. And we, ha and we know hyenas, sometimes they mob lions and chase them out of their kill. So she has to be vigilant and always on the watch because she don't want to share with predators since she's alone here now if the sisters are around then they take turns eating and if she gets a full then the sisters join in she'll be okay but at the moment she needs more attention make sure that no one is around to take over the kill now this will last them for a little while i'll say a day or uh, two days maybe three days but lions are known to go for without food or even up to a week. Since this is a small meal for to share with the three of them, I reckon maybe tomorrow evening they might go for something else. This will at least give them energy to go for more food. Since we've been following this pride, they had not got food for about three consecutive days, simply because of failed attempts see how she's panting slowly it tells you that she's the one that did the hunt now sorry come again with your question I didn't get that clearly Lando, you're asking about if wildebeest have tough skins. Yes, they do have tough skin. But then predators, lions, hyenas have have 
bacteria that can be, help them or enhance them to digest such kind of material like the, the skin and all that. So with that, sometimes they avoid eating the, the skin. So they will softly avoid the skin. But yes, these animals have tough skins. Now, one of the sisters has joined in. See, she, typical what she's done, she's gone to rest. And then when well, the sister is still devouring the, the carcass, now the one that went for a hunt will go. The other one that was eating earlier will take a little rest and maybe go drink some water and then come back eat. So she will go to the shade as the rest continue eating. Isn't that beautiful? So in Atlanta she's busy, you know, now licking her paws. That's typically a way being a leopard. You know, they do that, you know. This is how they finally clean their, their eyes when they lick their paws like that. And they sometimes they wipe their eyes. So, but that's probably just because of maybe there is a ticks. You know, they're very, they have very a rough tongue that can able to get rid of the ticks wherever the ticks is. You know, so we're looking at this young girl leopard. She hasn't yet, you know, breed. And then could be soon that she might breed. And then for... Jane, welcome to the show. So you want to know if big cats do sharpening their claws, claws on trees, you know, many of time we see cats, you know, you know, stretch but use trees, you know, and all they do, they just pretend like they're gonna climb that tree, and of course, they they, they produce this, you know, claws, you know, since they are very much attractive, and they hold on trees, and then it's how they stretch, but also it could be the way of how they sharpening them, that usually there is. Um, is hyena still there so yeah that's what they do but mainly you know these cat clothes you know all born very sharp ever and you know well designed for a you know the, you know specific job they do you know and that's why these claws they're attractive they're not always permanently out like cheetah or a regular dog or a hyena these are then the different is that they use them for digging around, you know, soils and things like that. Of course, their nails kind of not very sharp, but wound up a bit, and not designed for a probably grab and, you know, of course, you know, they stay wound up. For that case, these specific cats, since they're well designed with this attractive, very sharpening claws, they only, you know, produce them when any need or, you know, when they chase and grab something or immediately climb right up in the trees and the only time you see these claws sticking out. But, yeah, um, could be the way of sharpening them, but could be, you know, a lot of time we found out it's all about when they do that, you know, it's kind of a stretch when they need to. They can stretch sometimes. Look at that behavior she's doing when she walks, probably because the hyena's still around there. And it's a way of maybe she don't want to get, um, you know, a lot of hyena get comfortable with her. So hyena's still way down there. So yeah, that was a very good question. I know a lot of time I've seen that, you know, and then all I've seen was, you know, cats all of a sudden they have been sleeping for a long time. But when they're up, they rather stretch you know, their body, when they're on the ground, all you see, you see all the back bent down and all straight, just like a regular dog. But climbing trees, 
it's one of the also stretch but could be the way of how they're sharpening their claw. Go back to the meat there. Still there. Well, looks like it's still plant of, well, I would say plant if it's just going to be for today. And it's going to be one of the also warm day that it's very, when I drive past there, it looks like it's like a little dry, jakey bull tongue and it's in no way it's going to go to rot very soon. So I was there when talking about she's not yet breed, but it could be soon once you get a male around here. And of course, the breeding is going to happen soon, anytime. So I'm going to hey, take another time here with this beautiful brain, this little So, from the leopard now to the eating lioness. Now the second lioness that joined in, seems like she was hungry. See how she's turned the carcass on the other side, trying to get the softer tissues from the rib cage. The first lioness that was first on the kill has eaten some part and then gone to take a rest. Now this is what this one will do, at least because there are three of them, she will eat her part and then the other, the third one joins in. Now when it gets a little bit hot, she will definitely pull the carcass to a shade where she will rest and guard the kill for the entire day. A typical for lions to get their kills away from predators. See, she's watching over there's some warthogs over in the distance and of course being opportunistic hunters sometimes they can take an opportunity and go after something else even though she's feeding wow look at her power and how she's turning and dragging that carcass yeah good position now she's holding with her claws on the lower part of the carcass while pulling the cartilage of the flesh with her mouth. She's fast licking with her tongue to rub it and make it soft where she can cut the skin. Now someone asked about someone asked about if the water I mean the the wildebeest skin is hard. Yes it's hard. See what's happening. She's avoiding the skin and getting into the softer tissues in the inner body. Right, so in the previous segment we showed you that little ant lion and I thought we'd just quickly show you the little pits that they create. So if you have a look over here, you'll see that it's this little cone-shaped pit um, that's formed in the in the sand. You usually, usually find them in the softer sands along the roads. And what we often find in the mornings also are these little um, these little marks. You'll see these lines that come from these pits. So usually they'll they'll make a new pit every day, and they destroy the old pit. And they're usually active at night or in the cooler hours of the day and they make these little pits and like I explained earlier when a little ant or something comes along and falls into this pit this ant lion will throw sand onto it and then try and pull it under the ground but really really interesting little creature and it's actually it's a larvae of um, a lace wing which is a really beautiful um, flying insect then they themselves aren't that beautiful but interesting creature nonetheless and i don't know if you remember but when he was on my hand he actually moved backwards as well and that's how they'll move so once they they leave this this pit they'll actually move backwards to a new section they they destroy this and it'll create a new one by moving backwards and when it's really really hot that's why this was a good time for us to catch that other one when it's really hot they actually go down quite deep just to get to to stay away from the the midday sun or heat and they'll just rest under the sand yeah I think we'll continue for now we're gonna see if we can find anything else 
along the way. He has done a great job. Look at the hip bone. It looks like this flesh is so soft because these are young wildebeest. Then this, the flesh is tender and soft. Now this lion is having a good time devouring this carcass. Seems like she's enjoying all the meat there from a hard job that was done by her sister. Of course she played a role because we have to do this talking game, isolate game, and one of the lioness will definitely go after. Now, that is a very cool, cool thing to see, but then for all of you viewers who sometimes you might think this is not good, this is nature taking its course. We have lions eating to make a success, and this environment has to have a food chain where if the, we have lots of happy was then we have we'll be having problem with maybe the dung and the grass will be off so we have to have a balance in this food chain now look at how strong she is and how she's pulling it tells you that she's enjoying this meal now the other sister or the big alpha female has not yet joined in i'm sure if she joins in by the end of today we'll be having no carcass here. We'll only, only be having the bones, maybe the, the horns. Now what part will be left not eaten? Now look at how she's turning the carcass. So they avoid the intestines, they avoid the horns, the hooves, that is what will be left. And of course the strong bones that will be left behind, the rib cage. But some of the very soft bones always eaten. Now afterwards, after this carcass is devoured, then vultures will come in, jackals, hyenas, who we call the cleanup squad. And if it were not for them, then this environment or this entire ecosystem will be not in a good place. She is turning, she's turning the carcass all the way around, trying to get an advantage of all the softer tissues before she goes to the muscle. You can hear how she's tearing the tissue, slicing. So the canasial teeth are the ones that slice the tissues. Wow. Yeah, that is part of the softer tissue on the intestine. Remember, we're coming to you live from the Masai Mara. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to come to us, hashtag wild earth at the comment section on youtube at fc and for the kids that are watching please your questions at wildartv.tv cc has blood on her face now when lions are seated they groom each other and sometimes they clean each other she will clean the entire blood by the time we get here in the evening she will all be clean a very very warm welcome to everybody we hope that everybody's had a fantastic weekend and the week ahead is filled with endless blessings and opportunities. My name is Kyle, and behind the camera is David. Welcome to Tswalu Kalahari. We have decided for the morning that this is where we want to be, at the Rockstar Meerkats. I have just got this feeling that we are very, very close. In terms of time frame, it is the right period to where these little um, meerkats should be emerging from the burrow system. So we're going to hold off over here and uh, see if we have any activity from, from these little ones. We haven't visited them for about two days, so an update would be good. 
And then uh, along the lines a bit later, we've also got a bit of a reference work with everybody. Obviously butterflies and dragonflies we saw in the past couple of days. But I hope everybody's been well. Please, if you have any questions for our young ambassadors, our young earth warriors, uh, kids questions at wildearth.tv. And then for everybody else, hashtag wild earth. What a stunning morning it is. Whoa. Very, very beautiful. And then uh, once we have an update on these little guys, we will be sure to let everybody know. So, you know, your cat is one of the also good animals to look at them. You never get tired of them because they always do something just like a mongoose, you mean. But yeah, with Lalamba, she just got down to this little cliff and then it's probably just because you maybe get annoyed that hyena but what was seen in the distance was a visual of a impalas and a way off distance chasing each other around and then she was looking at them possibly if they ever decided to come and drink and then I believe she will be very much interested but anyway it looks like the way she's down there even if they got close to that water hole, she won't see them. It's because of maybe, she you know, she had a meal and she's not actually pushing too much to hunt. It's amazing the way she is able to see her true color. March, welcome to the show. And yeah, so you want to know how do the big cats, you know, keep themselves cool? You know, this is similar like what the dogs does a lot of time. A shadow is one of the thing. When they're in a shadow, you're in a hot, but they're still, you know, very difficult for them to be able to control the heat. And not like human, you would sweat, go to the shower again every now and again, or wipe up with towels, a few dribbling of, you know, sweatness, but not with this hairy spot cat. Usually you see them paint like this, and then they open their mouth, you know, kind of salivate, you know, paint, and that's how they keep them, you know, uh, uh, themselves cool. If they ever higher temperatures or uh, tired of maybe they find they were running after something and they'd fail. But you see, you see them just take it easy, paint, you know, to cool themselves off. So yeah, this is how they, you know, they cool themselves. They won't, they're not like an elephant where they will go swim. Cats, they can contact with water when they need to, when they have to, when something maybe is in the water. A lion can, you know, get into the water, great, get it out. But they don't really mainly swim like elephants does. Just gonna fast asleep in there. Well, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be in this position of this cat. Hopefully she is going to wake up and maybe move around, which will be very good for Andrew to see her just walk uh, in the ground there. I've met this huge male buffalo here that was fast in the middle of the road and just stood there and I couldn't move and I thought, I'll just wait until he crosses. And he's just looking at me and these are animals that are very difficult to read and the males especially of buffaloes uh, you don't take chances with them they look very harmless very docile but it takes seconds for them to do a lot of damage what happens when they get a little bit old and they're not with the main herd they get very grumpy and you can see just her behavior they are <coughs> to the blues and apart from that one, there's the other one on the right there. 
and they have formed their own small little bachelor club of very senior citizens. Look at the size of those horns there. Serena, good question. You're asking how heavy the buffalo's horn. I would say there could be anything between <coughs> two to three kilos, and especially for the males. Now, look at the base, which is apparently the horns of the buffaloes and skull. That one has, I think, a wound. Is uh, the horns and the skull are compacted together? It's like they grew from the from the skull, just like the ossicons of the giraffes. And back in my village, Serena, what we used to do way back, our grandparents they used to get buffalo horns and they use, they would use them as glasses uh, uh, to drink wine. Anytime there were celebrations like weddings or harvest or other big ceremonies in the village, the very senior citizens, just like these buffaloes, would use the buffalo horns to drink some wine. And then they would cut it in a way that it would get a good base they could rest on a table uh, without tipping over. So the wider the base of the horn, the bigger wine or amount it could hold. So the oldest person in the village would be given with the biggest horn of the buffalo. Not anymore today, Serena. What we do, we use cow horns instead as glasses. Hello there. Some of these old buffaloes, when you look at them, between those horns, they pick lots of soil from the ground as they feed. And if any slight moisture will fall in the soil between the horns, small plants will grow. Look at that. It got a small wound on the right there. And I think it could most have likely come from a fight with another buffalo. That wound looks quite fresh. And if unfortunately we get some ox pickers on him, they'll just come and make it worse because they'll come sucking that blood from this buffalo here. Occasionally when they go for each other, you see them like putting the heads on the ground, swinging their heads. And they're looking at some other buffaloes from a distance. In Africa, these buffaloes have brought so many casualties. For me, buffaloes and hippos are not animals to play about with. And even today, we want kids, when you're out there herding cows or sheep or goats, and you see buffaloes, especially lone buffaloes, be very careful. Well, buffalo, I'll leave you there. You don't look very happy, and I'll head out to look for something else. Now, buffaloes sometimes fall play, prey to lions. And right now here we have lion devouring a uh, wildebeest. Now this lion, for those who are joining us live, is the second one from the one who had brought down this wildebeest. Now we didn't see the kill, but we happened to have come just a little later after this kill happened. So the first lioness, took part, ate a part, and she left, went to rest. Because I can, I can assure you, they did a very tough job trying to isolate this wildebeest and maybe go after. Now, a little while ago, this carcass was almost full. Now, it seems like she was hungry, I can tell you. She's devoured almost a quarter of this carcass in less than 30 minutes. Now, lionesses can eat up to about 20, 22 kilos per sitting. So they actually consume about almost 20% of their entire body size. So in relation to the males, the males take a lot of food at a sitting. They can eat up to 35 kilos. So if the male was here, I'll tell you, 
this carcass will almost be complete because having three lions devour this young wildebeest then it will almost be complete. Now she's eating as fast as she can because I'm sure she's out in the open you can tell by how she's keep, she keeps on looking. It's almost time for predators but I'm sure she's not worried at all being in the, the apex predator. We have a sister who has not yet joined in to eat. Look at how she's pulling the softer tissues there. Really? So these lionesses had tried for three consecutive days without success. Now today they've actually gotten lucky with this boiler beast. Now this will not last them for, for longer because it's a young boiler beast and they're having to share three of them. Leanne, thank you for your question. Will the lioness eat the stomach content? No, Leanne. The lioness being a carnivore. So carnivores don't eat herbivores material or maybe the vegetable material like the grass and all that. So the stomach content has lots of vegetable matter or grass. So they'll avoid, she'll avoid that. She'll only eat the softer tissue of the intestine and then leave the stomach content. She's gone down to the steak. Look at all that lean meat and the cartilage. Wow. The ribcage has some soft tissues. That is where she's actually picking right now and drinking lots of blood. Now, blood gives them energy. Sometimes you see when predators bring down prey, especially lions, they go for the blood. And even cheetahs sometimes I've seen them do that. So the blood gives them lots of energy because they've done a very tough job. She has to keep on looking because you, know, you don't have to like sit down there, eat well, you're not checking around because sometimes hyenas take advantage of these kills. Now hyenas have a very st strong sense of smell. They can pick this scent downwind up to more than five kilometers away, including jackals. See, checking around where the sister is. Look at the blood in her face. Wow. Good job, you girl keeps on carrying eating, look at her stomach. She's getting full. And I'm sure she will go and rest or maybe pull the carcass to a safe place where she will guard the carcass. And then the sister who came in first will continue eating. So they'll take turns eating until the carcass is completely finished. Now what's gonna happen here? She's gonna puncture that stomach. And like Leanne, if you're watching it live, see she's puncturing the stomach and then the stomach content will be split up there. And what they do, she will again cover the stomach content to avoid a lot of smell who will attract predators. What a way of getting rid of the smell lines, also clever enough to do that. And then leopard also, it's one of those animals that, that unlike expose their kill to somebody who will smell it and come and steal it. They definitely covered the contents so that to get rid of the smell. But our Princess Columbia, you can see, looks like she need a pillar right now. They, she just feeds herself into that little cliff and Take it easy, painting. You can tell they actually her head right on the floor. And this is how she's comfortable here. By doing that, she able to pick up any sound. If anything, walk around, around here. 
she would definitely say have they have an incredible hearing so when they're lying on flat on the ground and they're still you know listening and also but listening it's key beautiful tail so I probably she looks like Probably the fly is giving her a hard time. It's getting slightly warm and a lot of flies, buffalo fly, those are back in this beginning of the summer. They give a lot of hard time on antelopes, cats, buffaloes, everybody, lions, elephants. Lexi, welcome to the show. Um, you want to know if leopards sleep longer than the lions? Uh, lions sleep slightly longer. The leopards, they tend to depend on what situation they're at. Also, same to the lions. If there is nothing happening, they can be just, uh, you know, chilling in that shade for a long time if nothing disturbs them. But we see seen leopards doing better, you know, stood up, do something, change spot very often to another spot or move into this thicket. Because these animals also, they, they don't really like open. They get up to the open when they want to, but you mainly find them in the thicket drainage line system and this is what they like most. But it's for their hunting, pushed by the situation of their hunt. Look at this. Look at these beautiful legs I got. This is what we were talking about when we were talking about attractive claw, which when you look at these paws, you wouldn't actually think of anything could be inside these, above the, this toenail they got. But it is indeed very much sharpening claws that attract inside. They only need them when they need them for emergency, you know, climb trees or you know, grab, helps them for hunt. A lot of time, you know, that when they hunt, it's not about, you know, biting, it's all about grabbing with this, when they chase. And that's what a lot different what cheetah does. And it brings too far difference from there. Just a fallen out slip there. Well, I'm, I'm gonna be in this position for slightly more longer again. found this beautiful bird of prey perched up in the tree and I don't know if you can see the color very well but he is almost completely brown and there are quite a few brown eagles out here and how we could it's a juvenile but batelier eagle and how we knew that was from a distance even we could see that the wingtips extended past the tail these batelias have very short tails so that is one of the one of the ways you can identify them and when they're young, they have this brown plumage and they only change to the black and white adult form when they're about six or seven, which takes about four molts. But if you have a close look at his bull there, you'll notice that the colors on his face, it's already starting to change. So there's a red tinge on the face and on the bull. And then also on the talons, the talons are also turning red. You can see there's a nice breeze up there. You can see the feathers blowing in the wind. Right? These birds often help us to, to find carcasses, actually. They're very, very sharp and often scavenge. And if you see a batelier circling and maybe going and they perch in a tree somewhere, uh, there might be a carcass. They're often the first ones to actually find these carcasses and helps us find predators. Them and the tawny eagles and then the vultures will come. Jessica, I must agree, I also love battler eagles. They are so, so beautiful. 
really one of the one of the prettier eagles out here, I would say. And it's also our and beyond logo. The um, I know that the the scientific name of the batelier actually means beautiful face. So if you look at an adult batelier, they've got that really beautiful red and yellow on their face. It's very striking. Really pretty bird. He's just posing for us there, preening, cleaning his feathers. While Batlia eagles will also love to be on top of such trees. But instead, I got some primates here. Can you hear that? I think that's a youngster that's being disciplined either by the mother or the father. These are the olive baboons. And what is interesting, they are all in a tree that to me has very bitter leaves and bitter, I would say bitter, bitter fruit that is called the Kenyan green heart or the East African green heart. But the baboons will always enjoy eating the fruit from this tree. Look at that one climbing and looking because there's an order in how they'll feed themselves in the tree. Now she has to be very careful if the dominant male have given particular instructions that you guys are feeding from there or you wait, we drop you from the foot and you feed from the ground. She looks like a youngster to me and I think she's just uh, disobeying. That's why she goes up being very nervous because the one that we had screaming a little bit earlier, I think was getting disciplined by a senior member of this troop. Priscilla, very good question. And you're asking how many baboon species do we get in the Mara? Apparently, Priscilla, we got only one type. And it is what you're seeing that is called the olive baboons. But Priscilla, in the whole country, we've got two species. We've got another type that is called the yellow baboons. The yellow baboons tend to be on low elevation, much drier area, semi-arid, Priscilla, whereas the olive baboons, high elevation, uh, wet areas, they love forests like this, whereas the olive baboons love to be in open areas. These baboons will move in huge troops of anything 20, something up to 100, and being omnivores, They'll feed from, you know, insects, scrub hares. Sometimes they've been known to hunt leopards, but I think currently here, they are vegetarians. Leaves, they'll get, dig some tubers from the ground. Look at them. That tree looks like a young male. But the big males have huge heads big manes, huge cannon teeth that they'll use to either defend the troop or deal with other males. You get the males more involved in fights than the females. See how smooth that tree is and Funny, for these baboons, it takes them seconds just to climb up, pew, 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 all the way up. As some, up. some of them are quite, quite high. Let's see if Bungay, how far he can go. Bungay is the gentleman on the camera today. And he's basically eating these bitter fruits that for me, I highly doubt. This particular tree here, let us see, it's called the Kenyan Green Heart. We normally get these twigs from the village to brush our teeth. The bridge strings are just like toothbrushes and some very nice sap-like antiseptic 
comes from it. Yeah, very good job. It's very high. See how high they are. Very agile primates. Chris, the baboons apparently in the wilderness here have habituated to us from like from where they are. I'm looking at myself about 50 meters or 60 meters from where the baboons are. Of course, we've got a very good camera that brings them very close. But in the villages, Chris, it's a different ball game because in the villages, they will come to our gardens and steal our potatoes. They'll come and steal our maize. They'll come and sometimes attack our goats and sheep. And the relationship between us in the village and the baboons is not good. But from where we are, it looks fine because we have nothing to offer them and they're in the wilderness and they're home and they're just eating, uh, I would say, their normal food. You see that one had that green fruit? That's not ripe. When they're ripe, they turn color to orange. I remember there was a time we had a lady uh, back in the village who had kept her baby uh, in, in the farm as he was, she was working. And at one point she wanted to go and breastfeed the, the baby. And she went to the spot where the baby was, the baby was missing. We found out apparently a huge male baboon came, picked the baby, climbed the tree like that high and stayed with the baby there. So the lady went, couldn't see the baby because she panicked, she was hysterical, screamed, people came. And the story, because the story was being told from my village, I wasn't there then, a uh, very senior uh, person in the village came with an idea, go slaughter a goat very quickly and put the goat at the base of the tree and go away. So the baboon came down with the baby look like from that height, left the baby or put the baby where the baby was, took a piece of meat from the goat and the baboon went away. And I thought that was quite a moving story. Apart from feeding the baboons also will always exercise their muscles, their agility to jump from one branch to another. And I'm very well entertained by these baboons and I'll let them enjoy the breakfast as I move on. So, he yeah, is about the same. Columbus, though, it looks like he's a little bit alert right now. There's a bit of a, there's a bit of a impalas with running around in front of her but so that she's not very much interested for now for then but you can see how she always look towards that directions so, i mean part already arriving in the dam so let's see how she checked out so leopard reproduction um, it's uh, unseasonal for them, so, and that's why I was saying, you know, earlier then. So about that, so, any time from now on, once she finds a male, she'll conceive. And the pregnancy, it's anything, 100 days, 100 days, 95 days, and then give birth. To anything three to two cups and for that they're very much highly mobile animals especially females due to the hunt but when they just after giving birth they reduce traveling around so much just because they need a lot of time to spend with their young born babies give them milk very often Linda.
and uh, welcome to this beautiful show. I uh, hope you all. So, if you want to know what was my memorable uh, uh, leopard sighting I ever had around here. So, you know, Carola, the female. Carola, which is the mother of Tlalamba, which is, I mean, mother of Tandi, which is Tandi, mother of Tlalamba, right here. So, looking at this generation. So that she was, she was my favorite a cat. If you want to talk about cat, she was a very much successful cat. She was an experienced leopard I ever seen, and she used to, you know, hunt very successfully and give birth a lot of time. You know, all of spring also you know survive look at them grow up safely without any of them getting killed you know i've seen that leopard you know she bring a lot of generation in this in this part of the the earth we at juma and the surrounding area some of the males are full growing now they just vanish off it reminds me of you know quarantine and gnuma that i all spread around the quarantine you know, is often seen far east and then Kunyum, i think is probably somewhere south malamala area that's where I, last time i heard you know she was she was gorgeous animal she was so we're talking about now the leopard that would be able to take care of situation you know knowing exactly how to you know always stay safe make sure their babies survive and then we seen her trying to mix male in the area. It was a strange animal, such a leopard to do that. So in that time, you know, it was uh, this male, Jordan, and again from Jordan, and then, you know, she mixed, trying to mix with, um, you know, uh, and bull at that time, you know, and we saw a lot of stranger behavior of that cat. So it's probably trying to mix the gene pool with their baby so that you know they they don't come across a lot of situation of getting killed from another male because that happens so we were not sure what she was doing so probably she was trying to discover both and but unfortunately it comes in a time for her to in the end this earth still sad the way it happened on the way the courses take its courses so yeah, she was my favorite, a leopard, Carola. So we were looking forward to this beautiful Talamba as a grandchild of um, Carola. She might actually react the same. We're just gonna see, you know, she haven't yet breed. Gemma, welcome to the show this morning. So you want to know if this Talamba is bigger than Tandi? No, she's still small in size. Size, small cat. So Tandi, as a mother, this leopard is only about reaching or three years old now. Somewhere there. And it's still way less than to be an adult. Well, she's in an age of where now she might tolerate and conceive soon, but still she's not actually the average size as her mother. I'm going to wait here. It's always nice seeing leopard, especially being one of my favorites. Now here we have the winos. So this lioness has already eaten and she's having a rest. The second one has already left the carcass and she's also taking a rest. Now the third one we don't know where she is, but I'm sure she will come to join or eat later. See she's also trying to check if there's anything approaching the 
the, the carcass. Good distance, safe distance for where the carcass is. She's not yet pulled the carcass to a, to a shade or maybe where they'll rest. So right close to where she's resting, there was water. So after eating, she went, drank some water, and now resting. They'll of course go back to the carcass and eat more. But now they've had a full, since they've not had some food for a little while, now the food has, is, keeps on digesting. They have to rest and then go back to the carcass later. Typical of lions, they always try to guard the carcass. See, the lionesses are watching and keeping guard, knowing that the hyenas might come soon or maybe later. Now, when we pick up the thermals, where warm air will help the vultures come up, and that will be the first thing that these lions will try and do, go and protect or maybe pull that carcass away from the vultures. See, the, the, the carcass is still fresh, big enough to, to feed lots of vultures and also hyenas, then these lions have to take caution and keep an eye, look at what she's doing. I think something might be trying to get to the carcass, like I told you, so she has to run and chase it off. Typical of what lion will do. So nothing will be attracted to the carcass because the lion has to stay guard. She's not yet hard enough. So that's the reason why she has to go back and guard the carcass. See how she's walking, keeping an eye, or the eyes locked to the carcass. Don't wanna mess with the lion when there's food around. Running in a slow pace. That is how typical they stalk walking in a very slow pace and sometimes run to advance and get close to, to prey. The same way she's walking back to her kill. Now, she might go back and eat or maybe try to pull the carcass back to safety. Daniel, how big is the hyena clan? Owino pride, rather. Uh, the Owino pride has consists of only three lionesses, but we don't have a male that is dominant to this pride. So we have we have this lioness that is walking to the carcass. We have the other one that already eaten, and we have another one that has a collar. So we have about three lionesses in this pride. Now back to. The lioness, she's walking slowly towards the carcass. Now, she's gonna either eat a little bit or try to drag it to safety. And safety means somewhere where there's shade because it's warming up. Look at how she's running. Seems like something that she's at the carcass. Oh yeah, there was a vulture. The first vulture that came in. Yeah, you don't wanna mess with the lion food. So, I might go back there and see what this lioness is up to. See if she's gonna eat. See if she's gonna eat or maybe drag the carcass to safe position. Now the vulture has gone. Oh yeah, we have vultures soaring up in the air. So they pick up the thermals. So that's a good indication that one has already seen the carcass. We have the African whiteback vultures. We have the lappet faced vulture or the Nubian vulture. Rupal's griffon vulture all soaring up in the air. And we have one of the smallest vultures called the Nubian, or sorry, the hooded vulture around also. So, there's going to be an activity here right now, so this lion has to get this carcass somewhere safe. So let's find out what she's up to. I'm sure she's going to eat something first before she, she drags it to safety. Now I'm just gonna go slowly around her. Don't want her 
to be disturbed by our presence. So I'm going to keep a safe distance away from her and see what she's going to do. I'm sure she's going to eat a little bit and then drag it to a good place. You can see loads and loads of vultures up in the air. Something that lions don't like because they know definitely hyenas will come. Now, let me see what she's going to do next. All right, we are still waiting here patiently, keeping ourselves entertained, as I have to. Um, we have got indication that these meerkats are still here see there's a lot of fresh tracks from yesterday afternoon when they did a bit of sunbathing a little bit of grooming the little, the little tracks of the, the they'll be now juveniles or let's say them let's call them teenagers the teenage pups where they've been playing around the borough system here so we're still waiting patiently they should be coming out in the next few minutes the temperature is starting to rise which is good for them they want that warmth before they come out and if we want those little pups to come out we definitely want it a bit warmer just like we've spoken about before they are really really small so the first two three weeks they will remain within this borough system because they are very vulnerable to the elements when they were born they were born hairless eyes closed and so they need this period to develop and then once they have obviously a little bit of time then they'll start emerging and you want it to be a like it is there's hardly no wind it's perfect it's perfect to see baby meerkats <laughs> you can see how ready i am to see these little ones i hope everybody is as well um yeah but with the little tracks over here you can see i think we can see a little bit of the scat as well um just in front of uh, david can you actually see that one in front of you there I'm not too sure if you can, but I'll get it out of there and I'll, I'll point it out. A bit of scat to see as well. It's really nice to learn these, these smaller, fine-tuned signs. And only after time, when you have the privilege to be within a given area for an extended period of time, do you start picking out these fine tracks and signs. So just in the middle of the burrow system over here, there's a few pieces of scat. It's obviously been removed from the activity. Uh, a little bit of maintenance activity from the morning but they are definitely here definitely definitely here beautiful me catches such a stunning animal to watch more especially when they start to get out of their holes check around for safety just before they vanish off and princess, she's still right here. Like I said, I'm not going anywhere. So she's been actually, you know, hearing these impalas in the background. And then maybe she's waiting for any opportunity and that impala may run around in close to her. But for now, it looks like she won't bother spending a time going into that because they're in a very open impala so here it's only covered for her unless if that impala they run across the little out you know outlet so let's see what happened next Well, we've been on a bit of an exploration, but we've come across a female hyena up on a rocky outcrop. Now, when we first spotted her, she had an enormous belly. She was actually out on the road, but then she led us up to this little basalt ridge, which is quite interesting. And she's, I don't know if she's pregnant or if she's just eaten something, but she had very, very swollen mammary glands. 
Now, for those of you that might remember, a couple of weeks ago, we were seeing a female hyena sitting at a natal den. This is not the same individual. And the reason why I know that is because the ears are completely different. This one has got rather tatty ears. You can see there's a notch taken out of it, like a little triangular chip on its uh, right ear. Whereas that other hyena seemed to be quite young and had very, very neat ears. So I'm not sure who she is, but I did want to quickly fill you in on where we have been and why we've been so absent the past couple of days. Um, Mike may have told you there is a giraffe that has died. We don't know how it died. It's suspected that it was in a fight with another giraffe bull. And this tends to happen every now and then. And most of the Pridelands clan, which is the group of hyenas that we see here, are there. And the female with the blind left eye, she was there, but sadly, uh, it looks like she's just got one cub that survived. She did have two, but she's only got the one there. And then there's a whole bunch of other members. There must have been about eight or nine hyenas there this morning. So this one, I don't know who she is. Maybe you've seen her before, but it's been quite difficult to try and keep tabs on these creatures because they don't always hang around with one another all the time. In fact, hyenas spend a lot of time on their own, and only if there's a big communal den will they uh, spend time with one another. But that den hasn't really been active for quite some time. But she's just disappeared up around the rocks. We can see if we can go around. Maybe we get another view of her. But it's really, really cool. So we've got some really great footage of these... Um, of the giraffe. Well, the giraffe is not doing anything, but the hyenas are eating it. Last night there was a big a male lion that was there too, feeding on it, and there was a lone lioness at one point as well, so it's all very exciting. But we're just gonna shoot around the corner to see if we can get another view of the hyena. I'm sure, Taylor, you're gonna catch up with those hyenas, they know how good you are. Well, I got animals here that are not going to sneak or hide from me because where they are, they are going to stay there for a long, long time. They got lots of food. Yesterday we had lots of rains in the Mara. And I think further away from the Mara, the rains were even bigger than here and a lot of water comes underground and a lot of uh, underground seepage and this is near the marsh area of the Mara Triangle and I think the marsh that looks a bit dry the last two or three weeks is now coming back to life and all these different bird species have found themselves together because water is life lots of invertebrates, lots of crustaceans, crabs shrimps, worms, so many aquatic animals, and we got herons here, saccharibes, the great egret. Bruno, mainly where we are, we got so many crustaceans or so many invertebrates let's put it that way and i'm talking of arthropods like amphibians we got lots of toads lots of frogs we also got lots of fish and that's why you see all the hammercops here the great egrets the herons they got a lot to eat water comes to them and of course water makes the breeding also of the same invertebrates start to increase in numbers and the birds will de definitely know that very well we also got so many worms and a lot of aquatic animals on the surface of the water so mainly most of the birds that we're seeing here bruno are just carnivores and that's what they're feeding on If you watch her, you're saying bad water party, and it's definitely true. Look how many species are here, and it's truly a party, and different species, no issues, no bad blood between them, because the party has enough for all of them. And you notice like now, you don't even hear uh, the frogs calling, they keep very quiet, they don't want to be spotted. Now look at that heron, she is in that hunting mood unlike the sacred ibis that you're seeing there the egret and the hammercops 
the herons hunt differently. You'll see them once in a while in water. What should be waiting for my guess is a rodent or maybe a snake. Anything that will move in the grass. And then she's going to shoot her beak. Possibly on the head of the prey. Subdue it with, with her feet. And then apparently swallow it whole. Without even, you know, they don't chew, but they have a huge gap. And you see how their small necks enlarge by like four, five centimeters as the prey goes down the belly. And yes, this is truly a party here. Eating and dancing at the same time. Not sure what I could get myself if I'm in there. Stop fighting hammercops. And you can see some of the hammercops, they got the crest or the heads, the feathers out open. That reminds me of the secretary birds. When you see the secretary birds eating, they got feathers on their head. When they go hunting, they'll open them up to look big. And the same case also to that heron there. But the whole idea is trying to intimidate each other here. But there's a lot for everybody. And remember, we are coming to you live. So should you have any questions or comments, please send them through to hashtag World Earth on Twitter or at FC in the comment section of the YouTube chat channels. The young ones don't be left behind. Kids questions at worldearth.tv. That was a lapwing, the chick, spawing lapwing. All the frogs now have kept quiet. I'm sure they can tell the dangers. There's too many predators out here. And this is very good to see such a wonderful party of different bat species together as I move on. Seems like it's it's a busy morning with animals or maybe species feeding. We have the birds feeding there, and now we have the lioness feeding over here. Now, this a little while earlier, this lioness came here to chase a vulture that had already set place to try and eat or devour the carcass as well. Now, this lioness came here. I was expecting her to pull this carcass to safety, but now she's decided to eat reason being at least you'll try eat as much as you can make the carcass lighter so that she can pull it under a tree definitely because of safety and also away from other predators like and the vultures who will come and mob and clean the carcass within few minutes now we have vultures in position in some trees here we have all sorts of vultures. We have the Rupal's Griffon vulture, we have the African white vulture, we have the, the uh, hooded vulture who is also around here. Now, when you look at that tree over there, we can see that there's some vultures there. That is what we call the African white-backed vulture. She was the first one at the carcass. And the reason why the lion came to chase her way, because vultures have a very thick bill that if the lions would have waited for a little while, then the carcass would be entirely devoured. Now, this lioness, is pausing a little bit and then going back to it as if she's like watching what's going on around her. Still back on the growing, you can see that one leg has already been pulled down. One of the hind legs, still one hind leg up. So she'll eat the softer tissues and then go to that leg, get rid of the stomach matter, 
put the intestine away and then still eat the cartilage or the lean meat in the rib cage and definitely mostly pull the carcass away from here. Now, like I told you a little bit earlier, lionesses can eat up to 20 or 22 kilos per sitting. So this lioness has already eaten a full and then came back, went back to water and then came back. So they take turns because there's three lionesses around here. So I'm sure they'll take turns in eating. There's one of them that has gone to rest and I'm sure she'll come back to eat later. Before, there was an attraction here where we had some warthogs who came around and this land tried to get an opportunity to the warthogs, but of course, the warthogs ran away. Now, it's getting hot here, or warm rather, so the carcass will be hard enough Pierre, thank you for your question. How come there are no hyenas to steal the carcass? Now, hyenas mostly are nocturnals. Most of the activity of hyenas happen at night. So this area, uh, we, we have less hyenas about where we are. So I would like to say if it was at night, you will definitely see lots of hyenas. But it doesn't say that hyenas will not be here. So the vultures actually attract the hyenas. But at this time of the day, hyenas are not as active. Active. So that's the reason why we don't have hyenas right here. You can hear her canacial teeth slicing on the flesh. See her licking? trying to get to the softer tissue. Now that is one part of the skin that is trying to lick with her tongue. Lions are very tough. Lions have very tough or rough tongue. So when they rub on the skin, actually they pull off hair, which makes it easier for them to slice on that part of the skin to get through the, the meat. Awesome that we were watching Kalama doing the same yesterday. When she was up in that tree, you know, pluck the fur off, make it a lot easy for her to get in to the meat. But look here, yeah, it looks like we have a little visitor. You know, somebody was also trying to forage in the same position where this leopard is, which is a dwarf mangoes. And then she won't bother actually really going after them. She got a little bit of meat there remaining, so of course they're well known of attacking or taking anything from squirrels, dwarf mangoes and birds. This is when they need energy. For them kill big prey, it's always a good idea because then you know you know it keeps them spend a lot of time not to push too much on the hunt. Lana, welcome to the shore. You want to know how big is this leopard territory? So I know she just got a portion from her mother, uh, you know, Tandy. So, you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure how big it is, but we'll find out. And then once we get an answer, then we'll always come back to you. But, you know, it, it could be that, you know, so the whole, you know, middle of Gari and across to the north and to Beverly Sook, you know, was across to the south, to a little Gari, one of the other property, could be a little bit of hers as well. Once they have that opportunity to have from their mother, and then it won't be anything less than um, 300 or 
could be 500 um, square kilometers or if it's so many of them in the area where I seen a leopard occupied anything from 14 square kilometers which I think was because of there was not much of leopard that time these days where leopards population is great than it was before you know they have to make sure everybody get capacity of occupants around here to dominate may hear another vehicles coming in here so they're probably gonna have a look at the same animal while we're just gonna be waiting here still now leopards are territorial but not elephants but of course elephants will move and cover sometimes lots of kilometers now i'm here ladies and gentlemen with that elephant that you see there and i got very mixed emotions number one and most important this is baby jasiri for those who are new with that is the baby elephant i was talking about earlier that had a bad foot got treated has been recovering but i lost her for about a week i've been looking for her every day now i am saying i got mixed emotions number one i'm very happy to have seen her today after about a week but sad a little bit she is not with anybody she's all alone That does not spell doom for Bibi Jasiri because what I think she has done, she wasn't able to keep pace with the herd that had adopted her. And being so smart, she has known the best safety for survival is to stay in the thicket and not expose her to predators. She's still limping. I've been in her for the last 10 minutes. But look at the wagging of the tail. An indication she's in good spirits, albeit being alone. But if she's going to move, you'll see the limp. And currently, she's feeding. So I'll spend a few moments here with my friend and see if she's going to come out of those thickets and maybe we'll give you a better visual. So I've decided to check some of the water holes just to see if we could find anything interesting. And arriving at this water hole, we found this hyena just relaxing in the water. So, I mean, it's not that hot this morning. There is a bit of cloud cover, but on hot days, you normally see them lying on the outskirts or in the shallow waters just to cool down. If you look at, at its legs, um, you'll notice that it looks very dark and wet. So it just got up. <laughs> but have a look at the belly there. It looks like this hyena probably had Quite a nice meal last night. Looks like it's very full. And this is actually a really nice angle to look at um, the posture. You know, if you normally um, these hyenas have the front legs are really long, so very well developed, strong front quarters, um, and then the shorter back legs. So you can see that sloping back quite well now. watching something in the water and then if you look at the neck from the side here you'll notice that the neck's also very powerful very um, robust thick neck um, and that's how they've evolved to I guess drag around heavy carcasses 
beautiful, the reflection in the water as well. Bianca is saying that's a well-fed hyena. Yeah, it looks like it. It had something, a nice meal last night. I wonder what it was. I'm actually hoping that this hyena will go back into the water. I once, once sat and watched the hyena in the water and something, it was like something bit, bit it while it was lying in the water. It was so funny and the hyena just kept running up and down. It didn't want to leave the water. But uh, it was something, maybe it was a terrapin or something. It's like it's looking at its own reflection or something. All right, we're going to continue and we'll see what else we can find. Hyenas could be a concern to me if you get them in a big group, big clan, because they could easily bring my friend, baby Jessiri, down. Luckily, as I told you, I'll spend a few more minutes here waiting for her to come out. For all of you to have better visuals of this baby elephant, and there she is. And you can see the limbs that she's still got. I can tell you, she will make it. Niva, we are going to three weeks now with baby Jasiri Niva, and you're asking if she's going to survive on her own. And I tell you, she, she will. Niva, if you'd have seen this baby uh, the last three weeks, she was in very bad shape. She couldn't even do, I would say, 100 meters on her own without much pain and you could see the struggle she had but the very first time i saw her she was so determined to leave and i think she walked like a whole three kilometers from an open area heading to thickets like where she was or rather where she is because she knew being out in the open river she was very sure or rather she would have been very vulnerable to predators she got good cover now it's very unlikely you'll get hyenas or lions in thickets like this, especially the lions in the Mara. They'll always be in the open where they expect to find their prey, you know, the plains game, uh, be it buffaloes or zebras or wildebeest. And I think, or I'm very convinced, uh, she's going to make it. Look at her body condition. I'll bet the little limp. She looks perfect. One elephant of her age, she knows what to eat. Her small little tusks are coming out. Her trunk, which is the most, to me, important organ of any elephant, is intact, it's solid. Her only challenge is the front right leg. She'll get some very good uh, uh, tree cover when she leaves some shade. Lots of water to drink. There'll be lots of springs and wells. There are water holes in the tickets there, in the trees there. And I, I, I am with all of you that you feel sorry for baby Jasuri. But for me, as I say, it's pretty good news uh, that we have been able to locate her after, you know, missing, uh, going through the cracks without seeing her for about a week. But I can tell you, take heart. Baby Jasuri will survive. Because I had a diabetes. Make a bit of noise now. What I want to do is just maybe move forward a little bit and spend a few more minutes and wait and see if she'll come out and maybe we'll get a better view shows in an open place for her.
Christopher Swick, I really love your comment and you're saying one day at a time and you've been watching from day one when we started I think baby Jusiri has done exactly that one day at a time but I'm sure maybe by the end of this month we'll be seeing a different baby we've got a bit of her visuals now just of her back and so long as you see an elephant whisking his tail flapping the ears and it is still mobile she is perfectly fine What maybe I would think or want is another elephant family to come and adopt her because safety numbers. But if she has gone this far without being brought down by predators, the chances are she is going to make it. I will be talking to the game warden today and tell him where I found her. And should I miss, I'm sure. They've got better ways of doing off-road driving that we don't do to be able to monitor baby Jasiri and see her progress. Very clever baby, I would say, staying away from the open areas. And that open space to the right, I'm trying to imagine she might uh, come out uh, from that area. And if she does, we'll have very clear visuals as I wait right here. Beautiful, you know, herds of elephants. In this time of the day, more likely to be mobile than graze, browse. But here, yeah, Princess Lalamba. I don't know what now what bring into attention that looks like she was about to get ready. And then there's no sign of this impala that they were around here earlier. And but she's still there, haven't changed direction yet. Earlier we saw giraffe coming to the water hole there and then move off. So that was pretty much happening here, nothing. It was also that the dwarf mongoose that was running around in this area, but they have immediately changed their plans because this is not actually a very good place for mongoose to run around this time of the day where there's a predator here. So she's actually in a good position there where whatever will happen to that kill Saver, you want to know, welcome to the show, first of all. And you want to know, uh, amongst of all, all cats, who is the most vocal? You know, so lions, they're, they're the vocal sounds. You know, if you were to hear this type of cats, when you hear them from the distance, it looks like, a, you know, somebody, you know, with a very heavy, you know, wooden, you know, saw they're trying to cut very dry tree down because they're repeatedly doing that vocal so but they you know male they have a very tremendous sound that you know when you hear it looks like so well, there is something big cats back there you know lions they roar most of the time and only do a little bit of growl but these are vocalizations. It's it, that's what they do. They don't actually roar, leopard don't roar, but they can, you know, give a little bit of growl when they want to. But of course, you know, um, that's the sound they make. But leopard, I, I would suggest, is the one that in the area here they'll vocalize more than others. Where hyena, the whoop, which you hear a lot of time when it's but, you know, midnight, all this here, you know, that's kind of a whipping sound that you hear. That's from the hyena. And some kind of a funny noise they make looks like they're laughing when they get excited. And, of course, they don't really vocals like these leopards do. So, she probably, every time when she want to drink, she'll go down to drink. 
any time because water hole is right there close to her keel. And we saw Impala avoiding her, but they didn't even notice she's around here because see where there she is now. She's just in a cliff, which is actually way down for everybody to get a visual of her. And yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, well, I'm, I'm staying here with this cat, see what is happening. Hey, Unona. Um, Andrew, don't leave that uh, princess there. Stay with that girl there. Because I've also stayed with my friend here, the Siri. And she's come out in the open space. I anticipated her to do. Look at that front right foot. I'm not sure she's moving it like that because of pain. But you can tell from the anchor down there. It's quite solemn. We have never been able to know whether it was a fracture or it's sprained, but you can tell the foot is quite swollen. And maybe as I talk to the game warden today, I'll brief them on the same and they might give a different approach to this baby. We do not know whether she fell in a hole when they were playing. I would not want to think of a snare, a cable snare, because we do not have that in the Masimara. Or maybe it could be a natural infection. Animals also get sick. Could it be some sort of tumor? I don't know. Could it have been a thorn? Snake bite. I mean, they are all possible theories, but you can tell from the anchor downwards. She'll keep floating it in the air. Not which the amount of pain she's going through or not. So for a quadruple animal to use three legs, quite a challenge. We know elephants have heavy bodies to support. But she'll be fine. I mean, that's the, the good news. She'll be fine. Because if anybody saw her three weeks ago and seeing her today and knowing she's on her own unlike uh, the last time we saw her in a herd is all a sign of good things to happen well i'll spend a few more minutes with her before i wish her a beautiful day and hopefully i'll be able to see her again every other day Good morning, everyone. Yes, Team Extreme, Lauren and BK are out and about, I can assure you. We have had a very interesting morning of sorts, but we are now sitting with the Inkohuma Pride at Treehouse Dam. It's been a very busy morning, so of course I've already told you who we are, but I am Lauren, and this thumb that you are about to see is BK. <laughs> So I'm going to tell you about my morning because it's very important. We sat at the hyena den for a little while, but of course, as you know, once the adult leaves, who was Hart, we must leave. But the three cubbies, as in Hart's two and Corky's one, were out. I've not seen Ribbons two in a while. And then BK and I went on a huge adventure and we spent our morning with three male cheetah. But sadly, the gremlins are out in full force and we had no signal, which is typical. But the reason I wanted to mention it to you is the cheetah dynamics. I'm only getting started, by the way, are very interesting right now. BK and I, a few months ago, had four males who seemed to be roaming, floating, as they say, looking for territory. This morning, we had three males. The other day, there was a mother and cubs. So the cheetah dynamics in this area are very interesting. They don't seem to be crossing onto Juma, but they are staying in sort of Chitwa, Cheetah Plains, Torchwood area. Then we came racing to find Ngohumas, a treehouse dam. Now, at the other side of the reserve, 
just at the end of Philemon's cut line, which is really, really not far away, is the Talamatis. So we're going to spend a little bit of time with the Inkohumas, and then we're going to race all the way to the Talamati. So the Inkohuma Pride and the Talamati Pride are apparently both on Juma, really not far away from each other. So what on earth is going on? I don't know. But it's so lovely to see them all, and it's lovely to have Signal. Thank you, Gremlin General. Or maybe it was Marcel, but thank you. And of course, they're a little bit sleepy. They were at the dam, but a herd of elephants came and chased them off. Now, I haven't even managed to count how many bodies we've got here. Let us try. One, two, three, four, five, six. I can see at least six lionesses. Nope, seven, sorry. And a whole cuddle puddle of cubs. So not only is the cheetah dynamics extremely interesting right now, everybody seems to be moving, everybody seems to be shifting the lion dynamics. The Talamatis are right in the heart of Juma. They never normally come this far down south. They have pushed in before, but it's normally on the northern side, Bufosuk Cut Line, Bufosuk Dam, maybe in Yala Road North, if you know the area. If you don't, that's okay. They never come past that. And the other day we had them on Mamba, which is right down south. And the two dominant prides in this area, who are both under the sort of control, if you like, of the Avoca Male Coalition, are here on Juma. So we're going to bounce between the two sightings if we can. But I just think that's really interesting. They should be avoiding one another. Or are they both avoiding the new boys in town? The coalition of four young, handsome, strapping males who seem to be looking for a territory. Are they avoiding them? They've all got cubs of all different ages. There's a possibility that some of the lionesses, at least in the in Kuhuma, pride are pregnant we don't get to see the talamatis too often i'm afraid so i can't talk about them but it's all very interesting kiara you are 10 years old lovely to hear from you and you are asking what is a coalition well normally when we find groups of animals we can give them a sort of noun like a herd or a pride or a pack or a clan, but a coalition's a little bit different. We normally use the word coalition when we are talking about male lions or male cheetahs can also form a coalition. And it's just like a pride, but the male version. So it's males that come together and they stick together for life. Now, why they come together? because you would think that it would be better to maybe be on your own, is for protection. They can cover a bigger area together and they can mate with more ladies because there's more of them. They can hunt bigger items of prey and ultimately they can just hold a much bigger territory. So that's why male lions come together. They can sort of work together to push out any sort of intruders, any competitors. They just go from strength to strength. And a coalition is a very tight bond between male lions. They don't have to be related. Strangers can come together when it's lions. But if they are relatives, it's actually said to be much better because they can reproduce by proxy. They may fight over food, they may fight over ladies, but ultimately the coalition, the group of male lions, is very, very important to their survival. Just like a pride is important to these lionesses. They need each other. A lioness would struggle to survive completely on her own. Yes, she may separate and wander on her own for a little bit, but she will really, really struggle to be completely on her own for her entire life. And for a male coalition, Kiara, they normally try to cover greater areas, larger territories, because what that means is you can be dominant over many different prides. And that means that you can mate with many different females, produce lots of offspring, and therefore, your bloodline will be nice and strong. You can continue to spread your wonderful genes. So the Avoca coalition that we have is made of three males, and they are the dominant male coalition of the Inkohumas and the Talamatis. So we're going to stay with our Inkohumas a little while, but at some point we will move on to the Talamatis.
So how beautiful sometimes to see lion pride, especially in big numbers. Now from our Owino lionesses that were devouring our wildebeest, we've come across this herd that is slowly advancing toward the river. So this is a mixed herd. We have a few wildebeest and also a few zebras. Now, they, they always walk around together, being a mixed herd, herd like this, which helps or come in handy when, when de detecting or checking out for predators. Now, zebras have a very sharp eye. And so wildebeest take an advantage when they have wildebeest uh, or zebras around. I'm lucky for the young one that got lost, but typically of what happens, the bigger the number, the more the success rate. So when we have lots of wildebeest around and they happen to lose one, you don't know how many have been saved. Look at how the zebra is staring, an indication that the stallions have to watch. Now, these wildebeest are slowly grazing while they're walking towards the river. Presumably, later on, they'll be advancing to the river where they'll go and drink. Before, about two days ago, we had no planes came here. The zebras and the wildebeest were not here. So sometimes, because of the weather pattern, it sometimes drives the herds away or close to where we are. So it rained yesterday and the day before, and then an attraction for these guys. So wildebeest are known to even smell rain up to 50 kilometers away. Now, what attracts them is after the rains, the fresh grass that shoots up really attracts these guys. That's the reason why they're coming back again where it's rained and graze. Now, when they're grazing, they cut off the grass by, of course, the teeth and sometimes the hooves. So this is in line because when the wildebeest are the first ones to come in, then cut off the grass, the zebras come in and graze after, and then the topis and then the rest of the animals. So in the background, you can see elephants. Now, because it's warming up, you see most of this herd Michelle, thank you so much for your question. Now, wildebeest and zebras don't fight because there's no competition of anything. Look at how vast this place is here. They're both herbivores and they all eat grass. So there's no competition over food and they take advantage of the other because zebras help when it comes to eyeing predators. So the wildebeest take an advantage of that. So back to your question again, they don't fight because there's nothing to fight for because there's no competition over for food. Lots of grass to eat around. Now, those zebras are closely like, one is tearing, keeping an eye while the rest are feeding. Now, when they, this kind of mix had, you find sometimes lion taken advantage. Like we've seen earlier, one of the Owino pride or two of them devouring a young wildebeest carcass. They take turns to rest this shed there because it's warming up and then they'll continue feeding or grazing, heading towards the river later on. Beautiful. Here it's also warming up. Beautiful princess one. She looks like she just changed direction now. If you notice, this is a new direction for everyone. Back to this shore here. And looks like now she's looking to the east. So one hyena earlier gave up here. Probably been waiting for long. And then for now that hyena just moved off. And then of course, this is one of the what relations with other predators tells that you know such a leopard they're skillful they have a lot of a skill 
But again, their skill can be sometimes worth nothing if they don't really take care of what they kill. And we've seen this princess, what she done, both of her meal, it's up in a tree, which is provide safe. And you look at that jiggled berry that meat is at right now. It's very, it's in the bottom of that fog. And then to the top, it's all covered with whole branches. We know other scavenge from the air. We talk about tawny eagles because also they are, you know, scavengers. They, 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 they take remain of what's left from cats, anything that dies, these vultures, that, you know, and as well as a bottle eagle. So those are the scavenger from the air. And then if the meat exposed into an open area or in very open space, even if it's in a tree, but the bird of earth would definitely gonna spot that because this is how they do hunting. It means pick up thermos, but also sight from the earth, they were able to spot that. But what we see in the shit lever cat, nothing else can spot that there unless of course lions if lions get in that it's not actually far enough for the lions it can still the lions can climb that and get it but you know from the top not happened like i said yesterday you know we still need to see her today which year it happens it did happen we still got her and it's a sign of you know uh, yeah, it's a good sighting for everyone i'm gonna chill you with this cat The Inkohumas are just behind us at Treehouse Dam and a huge herd of elephants have just skipped jauntily down to the water hole. Listen. are coming too. We've got a herd of buffalo BK. Might not be able to see them too well, but they're also coming down to drink. Wow, we're gonna have buffalo and elephants at the same water pan. They might get scared at the last minute, but the Inkohumas are just behind us. They're gonna hear those buffalo. This could potentially be a very, even more exciting morning than BK and I have already had. Can you see the buff? show you how far away the buffalo are. It's not going to be the best views. You see them just coming in the distance here. Perfect. Buffalo on one side, elephants, and I wonder, I haven't got a view of the lions, but they are right behind us. Excuse me, 
everyone. I just sneezed. Okay, the buffalo are at the water hole. There's no way the lions will not be able to A, hear them, B, smell them. Elephants are running. They don't want to share their water hole with anything. Just buffalo, guys. Just buffalo. See the elephants? They're making a decision. They're communicating with one another and they're listening. BK, I think I'm just going to drive a little bit forward because these buffalo are streaming in. but they need cover. So it really depends on how this is going to play out. The water hole is completely exposed, as you can see. We've got, oh, this is a mega herd of buffalo. So what they would have to do is sort of sneak around the site. They've got their ambush predators. They rely on the element of surprise. So if they are going to hunt, and I can't see them, we've not got visual from here, they're gonna have to really, really sneak up on this buffalo. There's youngsters in this herd. It's a mixed breeding herd. I haven't seen so many animals at Treehouse Jam in a very long time. Tristan and I were both complaining the other night that Treehouse Jam is just, well, not what it used to be. And lo and behold, nature proves us wrong once again. Now it's hot might deter the Ankohomas, it depends how hungry they are. This is incredible. are hungry this is actually the ideal opportunity for them the buffalo are occupied they're thirsty there's a lot of noise from the elephant splashing the buffalo splashing there's the youngsters it's a big herd so if the Inkahumas really are hungry this is the perfect opportunity for them There's no way this can interest them. Wow. Horse lover. Thank you, BK, horse lover. You're saying, wow, this is amazing, I know. Tristan and I were literally just complaining last night. We never see anything a tree has done. Why, why, why? And nature obviously heard us complaining. <laughs> tree has dam is said to be one of the cleanest sources or cleanest bodies of water compared to all the other dams. And elephants are very fussy drinkers. They will really only come to clean bodies of water. I can't believe the lions are less than a hundred meters away. Look at all the buffalo in a line. <laughs> sad about not being able to share the cheetah with you all but I think this is making up for it. The buffalo are still coming.
quiet here and keep checking. If we get any glimpses of the lions, you'll be back with us. Good morning and welcome finally everyone to and beyond Pinder Private Game Reserve. It's a really, really windy morning this morning. And there's still quite a bit of cloud cover around. We had a little bit of a storm last night uh, and there's quite a, quite a bit of cloud cover around. There's a lot of wind. Um, and so we have been having a bit of a hard time with both signal and uh, with finding some animals this morning. But we have managed to come across some zebras and they're just standing where, where we parked at the moment is in a little dip. So they're just down here trying to get out of the wind. You might be able to hear the wind and see the wind moving the grass. So we set out this morning actually to, to find, try and find those cheetah, uh, the cheetah mother with the two youngsters that we saw yesterday afternoon. And uh, we actually found a different mother cheetah with her two cubs. And uh, we tried for a long time to show you guys, but technicalities out here in the bush should, uh, didn't allow us to do that. So we carried on and uh, yeah, we've been struggling uh, with both signal, but also to find animals. So we finally found this small group of, of zebras that are just resting. Some of them are, are feeding every now and then um, but with this wind blowing, they'll be quite nervous of predators. It's still quite nice and cool, uh, especially with the wind, with the breeze. It's it's keeping everything nice and cool. So it's possible that some of the nocturnal, well, more especially for zebras, the lions could still be active in this area. And with the wind, uh, it can mask mask the sound of of lions approaching. Oh, so Tamsin's asking, I'm sure she noticed that one zebra looking quite dirty. Tamsin is asking how do zebras clean themselves. And uh, zebras are one of the species that uh, practice something called aloe grooming. So they groom one another, but they also groom themselves. And uh, so they spend quite a lot of time actually cleaning themselves, making sure that there's no ticks uh, and cleaning their fur, mostly using their teeth. Uh, but they will also rub and scratch against bushes uh, and yeah like I mentioned they will they will clean one another in the areas where they can't really reach another thing they'll do is roll in dust uh, and then go and roll in some in some grass to rub that dust off um, but yeah we're gonna we're gonna probably leave these zebras and go and see what else we can find for you this morning Thank you. 
keep pushing on. And this adult elephant is not entirely happy at how close the buffalo are coming. Neither are a threat to one another, but still they like their personal space. Beautiful, you know, elephants and buffaloes, herds. It's incredible sighting me. We here at Gary Dam. Now we've got a rival here. Now the herd of elephants just arrived, trying to cool themselves after drinks. See how they do that? Spread with water all their body. I was hoping maybe they're gonna swim, but maybe no. Not the right time. Another baby right on the floor, also trying to get dirty for protections. And we left the Watalamba there lying down. We're gonna go back to see what she's doing. Seems we're struggling to find shade. Finally, the sun is right at her. How, how young the smallest elephants in this herd here, Rusty? Good question, Ned. Welcome to the show. Oh, that's had a little bit of a trumpet there. So I've seen quite a, like three of them in this specific herd we're looking at. I've seen three of probably three, three different age, but there are three of them roughly. The other one, fourth one, is slightly bigger than the rest. And they're still young, probably anything from what, probably six, 
four months, six months old, youngest among this herd. But remember, they're very protective when it comes to that. Look at this young one also, feet between their mothers. As their mother disturbed the mud, water turned to mud. So this is how, you know, cooling off system is gonna take place right here. Look at them. And after that, sprayed with mud like this, and eventually walk out of here and put sand over their body again. And you all think that they have a very thick skin, they don't feel anything, but in, no, they do feel a lot of insect on their little crack of the skin, or fold of the skin. I'm just gonna stay here and watch them.
just a little update on the Rockstar Meerkats. Nobody yet. Um, on a little bit more investigation, we were speaking to Veronique, which is obviously, she's dedicated to these meerkats day in and day out. She says that she had a bit of a run in here yesterday with a Cape Cobra. A very dangerous snake and one that will snack up a little meerkat very quickly. So we don't know if these guys pulled a quick one on us last night. Um, we haven't been able to find any tracks going out from this burrow system. So instead of uh, holding it out here, we've sat here long enough. We're going to decide to, we've decided rather to pack up rather and we're going to head off to find something else. Just before we do move off, I mentioned that the scat within the bur burrow system here was that of meerkat. It's actually not. So just to correct myself, um, this is about five centimeters in length. They join together and if you look very closely there you can see this very rough material. That would be plant matter. More than likely roots, seeds and bulbs. And the structure and as well as shape over here, this is a very clear indication that this is actually porcupine. Porcupine obviously being quite a hungry um, individual for roots and bulbs and traveling great distances day by day or night by night, sorry. They are predominantly nocturnal coming out under cover of darkness and you can see around this burrow system that there's a lot of porcupine tracks, so very active over here. But yes, porcupine scat. But uh, we're going to leave these guys. We're going to hopefully um, gather a little bit more information from Veronique this afternoon and uh, we will be sure to let you guys know what's going on here. Meerkat, something that I've actually never seen in the wild. But anyways, we're back with the elephants. Um, we exactly what we said we were going to do this morning. We have come around to Ntlovu Dam, here right outside the eco training camp, where the boys have arrived. So it's just some males here now, no females, still no luck on the breeding herds. They seem to be feeding elsewhere, but you can see they're all gathering around that little mud wallow. That is their absolute favorite spot uh, to roll around. Yes, elephants will roll around, and hopefully we will see that in, in a minute, except with there being so many elephants all standing in the same spot, it's going to be quite difficult for one individual to lay on down and roll about in the mud. But it's quite funny to see such a large mammal doing that. You can see a lot of them have got their trunks that are nice and wet. They're also having a drink. The sun was up for most of the morning and it was super hot, but now a bank of clouds has rolled on in, thankfully. Otherwise, Odie and I would be burnt to a crisp at this point. We might also have to go in and join the elephants and cover ourselves with mud because at this point, I don't know if sunscreen is even working. A very, very peaceful morning. There have been lots of animals that have come on down, but of course I'm happy to see the elephants doing their thing as they normally do. You can see they end up having a lot of fun here. I don't even know how much drinking goes on at a watering hole when it's just the boys because they can't help but push and shove one another around and I suppose you never really get to finish any tasks. Now they're coming about, maybe they'll have a, a scratch on some of the leadwood trees that are around here that make for perfect rubbing posts. Most of them are in fact completely covered in mud. Apologies if I bang my hat and you hear a strange sound. It, it's the Mapani fly, uh, Mapani flies, Mapani bees and normal flies that are bothering us today. Shame, that poor elephant closest to the big tree there, all he wants to do is have a drink. And he got shoved out of the way because somebody else wanted to drink there. So that's the constant battle within elephants, but particularly within the bachelor herd, is they're all trying to show one another that they're bigger and stronger and that, that they deserve the best drinking point or they deserve to feed on this tree more than another one. And you can just see how relaxed they are and happy and I think almost relieved that they've made it to the water. It's not too bad though at the moment. There is, uh, of course, two big watering holes that they can visit here on Pridelands. We always talk about that. So. For an elephant to cover the amount of ground between the two watering holes is really not anything significant. And another thing that's been quite interesting, because we're obviously talking about the build-up of the, the rain that is hopefully going to come earlier this year, is that the 
ants have started to release their alates. So when I talk about alates, I'm sure you've heard of flying ants. Those are normally referred to as the termites, but essentially the princes and princesses. So the winged ants and the winged termites, but the ants are the ones that release theirs first and they've come about, which makes me quite suspicious that the rain is going to come within the next few weeks. So I really, really hope that it does. These elephants are going to be so happy. Especially once this pool fills all the way up to the top, I think we'll see lots of swimming again. Although they've been swimming most afternoons, normally around midday. Maybe they'll go on and it's hot enough for them to, to pop on in. But they're not just drinking once a day. So I know they were here yesterday afternoon. They came uh, also just before the game drive started and they had a good old time. They were swimming, they were drinking water, covering themselves with mud. And then about an hour and a half, two hours later, they were at the HQ where there is another a tiny watering hole. We do pump water into there and they were there again having another drink. So I think elephants in this area don't have to worry too much about consuming water just once a day, making sure they get over 100 liters in one go. They can sort of spread it out throughout the day. But goodness, the elephants in Namibia or elef anywhere really where they've got to travel huge distances to, to find water, then they might go, you know, 24 hours or even a little bit longer without really having anything to drink. So the elephants in this, well, the greater Kruger region don't have it too tough. They're quite fortunate. But one tusk is not here. I don't think this is the same group of elephants that we saw first thing as the sun was rising. I don't see Limpy anywhere, but I'm sure that they'll come this way. They were slowly moving in this direction. This is just another small group of, of the boys. But it's really not uncommon to see like 30 or 40 elephant bulls surrounding and Lovu Dam. You're going to make your own wallow now. You're going to make a new one over there where you can roll around in peace. That's normally where the warthogs go. They've actually started uh, wallowing in that section where that elephant is now pushing its feet. And, and it's so interesting to see how wallows are actually sort of developed. So it literally starts off, and I know some of you have heard this, but there might be someone who has just jumped on for the first time and has uh, never watched these live safaris or perhaps never even been on a safari before. And elephants and buffalo and hippos obviously being very large mammals, when they walk over areas where, they, where it is a bit muddy, they leave a huge depression in the ground. And that makes for a perfect spot for a warthog to fit its bottom in, where it will then twist and turn and completely cover itself in mud, and then another warthog might join. And eventually these things just get bigger and bigger. Then you get buffalo wallowing in them, rhinos, and then, of course, elephants will do exactly the same thing too and then you create these huge massive holes. There's a section here on Pridelands that I'm, I can't wait to see once the rains have come. There's lots and lots of wallows. It's all the way down on the southeastern corner of the reserve. It's beautiful, filled with huge leadwoods and then all these wallows. And I think that that's where a lot of the buffalo are going to go. getting tense here. The Inkahumas, who are really not too far away, are watching these buffalo. The elephants are all coming out of the water. I'll show you in a minute. Look, you see the lions? You see the buffalo? The buffalo have no idea the lions are there. If the elephants come out of the water, they might react. The elephants could, in fact, ruin this for the lions. If they smell them, they'll completely relax. View a view of the elephants coming out the water. Look at that small one peeking. It's tiny. And you'll be able to see all the buffalo in the background.
So if they smell them, they're going to react. They're going to trumpet. In Kahumas, this is your prime opportunity. could easily do this. The elephants are just about to walk in front of the car. They're so wet. <laughs> They're so wet and shiny. So from Juma back to the Masai Mara, we ha we've come to our Savo Den, back to our little two kittens. They seem so playful. Now mom has gone into the bushes there. And these two kittens are so playful, it seems like they're healthy and mom is doing a good job to protect and take care of them. Now this den has been here for a while and I'm sure this is where if not where she gave birth, because sometimes Savo would, would swap dens depending on the, the surrounding or if these predators or not predators, but this seems like a, a safe haven for them. Now these two kittens, unfortunately, when they get to about a year old, they'll all go separate ways. The only time you see Savo in pairs is maybe when they're mating, it's a mating pair, or maybe when they're young, or maybe when mom is accompanying a kitten. Now, a litter can consist of one, one to about four. Now, this two seems like healthy and mom is taking good care. They're so playful at this time of the day when at least it's warm and the sun is not too hot for them. So later on, when mom is away, they'll go into hiding and maybe when she comes back with food, she will again get them out to come and play. Now, when do Savos accompany their mom for hunt? I'll possibly say when they're about six months of age, 
That is a good time when mom will accompany the kittens to go out and hunt. They have a special modified ear for listening over into the grass. Look at how sharp those ears are. Now, servos are one of the cats that have a longer relative legs compared to the body size. Other cats don't have long legs. This is simply because servos always encounter them or see them in the savanna. Now, when they find prey, because they go for mice and rodents and sometimes even birds, So when they come across a bird, they kind of tend to have a looping jump to catch up flying off prey. Welcome back to Ambion Pende, everyone. Uh, you might, oh, there we go. That is a black rhino, and we found we found three of them. Now I know it's quite a tough view, but you can see quite clearly the two big ones. They're actually nose to nose at the moment. So there's the one that you can see very clearly on the left, and you can just see that that uh, deeply saddled back of the one on the right. Both their heads down. Well, the one on the right's head is down. It looks as if it's being quite submissive now I said three because you might just be able to make out a little calf standing right next to that one on the left so that one on the left is a female and she's got a little calf with her and it seems that that one on the right is a bull that is pursuing her and he is trying to court her into mating so that calf looks to be about four to five months old, which means that the mother will will start to come into heat again soon, or estrus again soon, and the the male can definitely sense that. So he's just patiently following her and waiting. And that submissive behavior we saw there is, is just him trying to him trying to get her to like him <laughs> because when she is ready to mate he's hoping to still be around you see how she lifts her head up and she's actually taking big mouthfuls of these burnt trees keep a lookout just just to the left of her and below her chin, you'll see a little bit of movement. That's her little calf next to her. And look at that mouth, hey? She, look how she uses that top lip, that prehensile lip to wrap around the branches. And then she bites, bites down and chews those twigs. Now the wind is blowing from them towards us and just knowing the black rhino behavior on, on Pinda, more especially that female with a little calf, if the wind was the other way around, we probably wouldn't have even seen them. They would have smelt us before we'd even seen them and would run for, would run away from us. So Joe Smith's commenting on the, the beautiful colors and I couldn't agree more. There's some reddish orange uh, leaves from the burnt fire, from the, from the shrubs that have been burnt in the fire. There's a bit of black on the ground where the grass has been crisped. And, and then there are some, some bushes that have managed to survive the fire that are still quite green. So, for, guys, I don't think our view of these rhinos is going to improve. Um, so we, we're going to continue and, and see what else we can find this morning.
again, we have not moved an inch, not even a small amount, but the elephant bulls have decided to come right round to the vehicle. Okay, you do not. There's two of them. You can't see the one because he's behind the car. But this fellow that you're looking at now, he's very relaxed. He actually looks like he's having a bit of a siesta. Look how those eyes are growing so heavy. And they will do that on these hot days. We'll start to see more and more elephants just relaxing under the shade of the tree. Not that there's any shade here. We're standing out in the open, but just having a moment to relax. You cannot come closer, though. You guys know that I don't like it when you stand on top of me. That is enough. Yes. Don't cross that line. Draw a line in the sand with that stick and don't cross it. Almost. You're going to put it on your hat. I put it on your head. It's very pretty. What a great disguise you've made. I'm just watching these Ellie's only just watch. Sorry, bro. So you can see the back of the vehicle. That's just how we've got everything rigged up. We've got an elephant bull right behind us. Oh, no. We might need life jackets. <laughs> we could be in for a flash flood here. Of course, elephants urinate and defecate on a regular basis because they have to drink and eat so much every single day. Sorry, it seems as though there's some just some audio issues there. I do apologize for that. It might have been just the way that I was sitting. Hopefully you didn't miss my funny joke. Well, I thought it was funny anyways. So I have a healthy respect for elephants. I really do. They're my favorite animal, but I also know that you must never play games with them. They are incredibly large animals. Sorry, I'm just telling this boy behind us that I don't want him to come any closer. He's stretching now. And he did just, like I said, defecate and urinate. He's also got a stick in his mouth. <laughs> I'm watching you. I can see you. No. Go away. Go and do what else you want to do. Anyways, and I don't like it when they come too close to me. These bulls are very relaxed, though. They're very, very, very chilled, as chilled as they can um, be. Especially, you can see this one here on the left-hand side. Look how he's just, just twisting his stick, playing with it. Yeah, just because it's, uh, it's just him. He got a fright. When when you move, sometimes what happens is that you, you do the smallest movement. And I think also the warthog. There's a warthog coming up on the damn wall just to the right. That gave him a fright. So the elephant bull was so fixated on Odie and I. Look at this. He obviously heard the trotting hooves of this warthog as it snuck up behind him. And he got a fright. And obviously he shook his head at us because, of course, he's going to take his frustrations out on life. And the fact that he's a bit embarrassed that something so small gave him such a big fright that he ran away. But it is, it's, it's really awesome to be surrounded by elephants like this, but you need to watch their behaviors. You really have to watch that they are truly relaxed. A head shake is like a last sign, you know, but there are other subtle signs. Look at this, look at their reaction now. The warthog, again, look at how they're reacting to something so small. Now that one in front is pretending to be a big guy and says, I'll chase you back up there if you're not careful. Go and drink on the other side of the dam. This is ours. <laughs> They're very funny. They're very sensitive souls, these creatures. But like I said, you need to watch for certain behaviors. So what I'd like to do is exactly look at this one. Look how this elephant's trunk is completely relaxed on the ground. This is an indication that he is completely calm. I think if he could, he'd be resting one of his legs as well. And we saw that his eyes were growing quite heavy. So this is how an elephant would normally have a, a little bit of a siesta during the, you know, the heat of the day. He's having one now. He's not got his head raised. He's not raised his tail away from his body. His ears are relaxed. He's not really glaring at us, you know, out of the corner of his eye. These are all signs of how to tell if an elephant is relaxed with you or not. The other thing that elephants will do is they'll do something called displacement behavior, or displacement feeding, you know, where they might start to feed on some vegetation, but they're watching you, but they're not putting anything in their mouth and they'll slowly but surely get closer and closer to you. And then before you know it, you've got a huge elephant bull towering right over the top of your car. And there's not much that you can do when that happens. Obviously, all of us are all experienced and well-trained safari guides, so we are able to read animal behavior. But we make mistakes too. That definitely does happen. 
but it's always good to be cautious. So you'll see, I, I get to a certain point where I don't allow the elephants to come any closer because with these guys, for example, at this age, you know, they're not really tolerated in the breeding herds. They're not quite at the point where they're mating with females, so they're quite frustrated with life. So the next best thing to do is to either A, chase other animals around, push and, or B, push and shove other elephants, or C, what they typically try to do is bully us in the vehicles. So we're back still waiting for our Savo kittens here. They've been playing up and about walking out of the den and coming out so playful and energetic. So we'll still be sitting here because I'm sure mom is about to leave now and go find something for them to eat. Now, as we wait, we've had lots of activity here. Birds coming here and the Savo kittens have tried to, to chase the birds, but the birds know that the Savo kittens are not yet experienced that's why they're playing some hide-and-seek games with them. Now, mom is in there. She's trying to hide and make sure that they go in there and then mom will leave them, walk somewhere else. Remember, we're coming to you live. Please, if you have comments, questions and comments, please don't hesitate at Wild Earth and on your YouTube channel, on the co comment section at FC for the young viewers, kids questions at wildart.tv. Now we have zebras and wildebeest walking towards the plains and the swamp. Because it rained yesterday, these animals have been attracted by the rain. They'll be walking towards the marsh. And I think because of the water, that's where they concentrate before heading further down to the river. What a morning. I am not sure I can even use words to describe that experience. Now the Inkohumas are very much interested, they're watching the herd, but I think the elephants put them off and the sort of openness of the dam, there's not much cover for them to execute a hunt. Now the herd are moving in the block of the hyena den, just to give you some context, they're moving back west if you like, northwest. The Talamatis and the Inkohuma could possibly both go after this herd. Now, as you saw, it was a mega herd. But I think there's a really interesting day in store for us. They don't look full. These guys are not full. They're not starving. But that's your dinner right there, guys. Now, in all fairness, a buffalo hunt takes a lot of work. They've got to be prepared, they've got to have enough energy, they can't go into deficit, and they've got to be coordinated. Liam, you're asking about a leader. This pride used to have a lioness called Nana, a gorgeous lioness who was the oldest, and she very much used to sort of... A leader and a pride is not exactly the correct term, but they all followed Nana. Now, since Nana's gone, she passed away, there's not really a leader. Within a pride, sort of, within the dynamics of a pride, all lionesses really work together. Now, generally speaking, the oldest lioness could take the lead a lot of times, but all it takes is for one to get up and one to start walking towards the buffalo and the rest would follow. Lionesses can also separate on their own as well. Sometimes you'll just find a lioness who's separated from the pride. She can hunt on her own. But it benefits a lioness to be with the pride safety in numbers. Especially when there's four new boys in town and there's a neighboring pride not too far away. I think the elephants put them off, not that the elephants would harm them and not that the lions would attempt to go for an elephant, 
but they're too vocal. They've got a great sense of smell, and if, though, if these lions tried to go after a buffalo, I think the elephants would have reacted, and that's what put them off, because that was dinner on a plate for the Nkomas. They're still very interested, and there's a lovely breeze coming through now, so we're going to sit tight with the Inkohomas for a little bit longer. I'm also enjoying some lovely weather here in the Matsumara. It's not hot at all, as much as the temperatures have gone up and like when we started in the morning and just enjoying watching giraffes and to see this particular in that condition or that posture seated there you can see how busy she is chewing cud of course the one behind her hasn't filled her tummy as yet and she need to keep browsing there little scratch maybe on the head or under the lip keeps feeding some just standing up staring and i'm guessing maybe that's the direction they want to go but they have to be very sure it is very safe now you'll see them they're looking at those trees there and they have known some of their enemies apart from the normal wild dogs and lions Giraffes have also been preyed by leopards. And of course, you can see that's a very huge, I mean, very good country for leopards. And they have to be sure before they commit to go there, as it gets hot, they'll have to make sure it is safe. Beverly, yes, you're saying, wow, a sitting giraffe. It's quite unusual. I mean, they do see giraffes, Beverly, but it's very rare because it is in that position, Beverly, they're always very vulnerable. It is quite an exercise or quite a production for giraffe to be on her feet very quickly. And when lions or other predators have been known to prey on them, it's either when they're drinking, when they've got their legs huge, splayed out, or when they're in that position, because what they do, she'll have to use first the back legs to swing her long neck up. She's getting preyed upon now by an ox picker under her neck. And once the hide quarters up, then she'll try and bring the front quarters up. And that takes almost like 35, 40 seconds. And in such a short duration of period, so many things. Would have gone wrong. The ox pickers, as they have done before, will try and get ticks out, especially in areas where giraffes cannot groom themselves, like under the neck and sometimes inside their ears. The beautiful oral escarpment in the background there, you just saw. Some of them, when it gets hot, like this one. It's taking the advantage of the shade of that tree. You can see it shimmering there. It's because of the heat of the day. Looks like a big boy to me. You can see the oscons are flat at the very top. Could have been an ox baker. And these are the magical sceneries of the Masai Mara, the wildlife in front. And it's not only the fauna, but also the flora of the Mara makes it very colorful. An elephant in the background there. And I guess that could be a bull. And somehow they get much warmer than the giraffes, because you can see the elephant is just flapping his ears. Mm. 
Tenian, that's a very good question you're asking. What species of giraffes we get in the Mara? In the Maasai Mara, we have what we call the Maasai giraffe. It's a Maasai giraffe, and they are always distinguished from the rest, of course, by their coats. Not one giraffe is similar to the other. And we also got some sp subspecies of giraffes in Kenya, not in the Mara, uh, that we call the reticulated giraffe. And those are further north in an area called Lekipia, and another subspecies that is called the rose child. But in the Mara, what we have are the Maasai giraffes. The numbers, population, perfectly doing very well. IUCN on the red list is not concerned about their numbers. And as far as I'm concerned, we have seen their numbers uh, rising pretty well. If you want to see what general direction the giraffes may move, because when they do that, they may all come together and start moving. Beautiful. Now we come back to this Tlalamba again, princess of this area. And she moved from the last position where she were, but now she moved into shadow. Not like where she was in a cliff. Eventually, sun penetrated through. Then she made a decision. Well, since we got here this morning, she hasn't actually gone to feed in a carcass. Karen, welcome to the show this morning. Hope you're right. And yes, so you're asking, you want to know that why does she paint? So many times cats, especially leopards, lions, you see sometimes dogs when it's too hot during the day, they, they paint just because, you know, they overheat, the body temperatures rise, and then for them, you know, they don't sweat. You may see them salivate while they're painting. And then, yeah, with the dogs. But the same, apply the same with this cat. Understanding this cat is actually full belly. And then the temperatures was a little bit higher. And now now it started to actually wind blowing a little bit, but probably that's gonna help. But you know, this is how you, usually when it's too hot, most cats paint or in a shed do that but also this is something it's about you know since she's full stomach that's the quickest digesting tech places and this is what is happening we've seen right there of course you're right looking at the cat doing that kind of like paint like this you know surprising but of course for the leopards it's usual lions it's about the same full belly all that you lie in a shed or could be in the open if there's not too much sun but paint so they just didn't take place so quick so we'll uh, you know I'm just gonna wait here see what final is gonna happen with this cat Welcome back to and beyond Pinde everyone and we've managed to find another black rhino and this one the first time we spotted him he was looking at us and he, he was actually downwind of us so he was smelling us and uh, we're about to show him to you and he ran away from us so we've come around to the next road and now we are downwind of him and so we're just watching his behavior he was he, he had his head up and he was actually looking in our direction um, but i think he's he's try, he's trying to hide from us hiding from where where we first saw him
But you can really see that uh, deep dip in the back, very characteristic of the black rhino. And also the vegetation around him, um, because there are browsers. He's feeding on all the leaves that, that you can see all around him there. I think, uh, but I think this one, yeah, he's not going to be coming out, so we're going to leave him in peace, and uh, yeah, we're going to carry on from here. Yep, you guessed it. We've got a few more individuals in, uh, joining here at Lovey Dome. You can now hear the squirrel that's shouting. I don't, what? I have absolutely no idea. We've got the the elephants, there's a couple of quilias flying around, and uh, we should actually get some really cool shots because I think that the quilias are going to come down to drink, um, so that might be nice if they swarm past the elephants. But they've been breaking all sorts of things, pulling around on the leadwood trees that are there, throwing sticks about, you can see they're bullying one another, you know, just casual elephant bull things that they like to do on a day. Squirrel? That's very loud and obnoxious. Could you stop? Squirrel's just like... You might be calling announcing to that squirrel that that's it. That's here, or maybe he has seen a, a raptor or something that I haven't seen. That's scaring them. But they just... They gossip between the squirrels. Yeah, they are just like squirrels. Sorry about that. Squirrels. Sorry about the audio issues there. Look how they've all lined up so perfectly now. That's quite cool, hey? They don't quite know what to do with themselves. They're not sure if they're going to keep drinking or if they're just going to have a... They're going to have a siesta there or if they're going to come up to the vehicle again. They obviously chased the warthog away, so they ran away from us. So we are elephantless at the moment, none standing around the car. But there, there's something quite special about moments like that. Very chatty Cathy up top there. Um, Odie, can you see all the quilias to the top right of the elephants on the trees? Yes, uh, Cammy, there's a very cranky squirrel. So, another go where birds are going. But anyways, let's just have a look at a few birds. Those are red-billed quilias up there. I'm not going to tell you too much about them because our plan for this afternoon is to show you quilias uh, silhouetted against the sunset because they come down and drink in the afternoons. But they're, I think they're waiting for the elephants to move. So because they're such small birds, they don't normally just fly down to like an open space to have a drink. Oh my gosh, no, banded mongoose, banded mongoose. Sorry, I'm distracted. That's so cool. To the left, there they are. Yes! We never get to see banded mongoose here. They are around. We see their tracks and we see glimpses of them every now and then. I just sort of saw this... It was like a shadow moving on the ground. So this is one of the biggest species of mongoose. We are forever showing you the dwarf mongoose, which is the smallest carnivore in Africa. Now, these guys are also very social, much like the dwarf mongoose, except when they run, it's so fascinating. And we should see it once they finish drinking, how they all keep together. And that must be quite intimidating uh, to a predator. I know I got a bit of a fright. I couldn't quite work out what that was for a second, this black patch moving along the ground but also extremely vulnerable to come and drink out in the open like this, just like those quilias are. So you can see drinking and then completely looking around. They have one another's backs and they won't spend too much time down here. I think that they maybe they'll drink, maybe even have a bit of a dig around in some of the elephant dung that's here. It'll be some nice tasty treats for them. You can see the one that's had a drink has now gone off and said, right, I'll just I'll keep an eye out on this side. But look how cool this is. That's so awesome. <laughs> now, Jen, that's really clever of you to associate with the mongoose to the squirrel and wondering if the squirrel is, squirrel is shouting because of the mongoose. I don't think so because the squirrel is actually facing the opposite way. It's looking at something behind the vehicle. Um, but yes, mongoose are typically a threat. Um, maybe not so much banded mongoose, but like something like a slender mongoose, definitely. So, where are you going? Well, they've got to navigate through all the elephant footprints. 
It'd actually be really nice if they came and fed, especially on the side that we're at because of all the insects and other invertebrates and things that could be hiding in between the cracks. Look how quick they go, though. They are so fast, not wasting any time out in the open. See, all sticking together. There's a couple of smaller ones which will struggle to keep up. I'm sure you heard the elephant rumbling. It was quite cool. As Mongoose stopped at that exact moment and also listened. Hello, boy. Right. We're going to have the same talk that I've just had with all of you. Sorry, but I'm watching these elephants. I'm not sure what strategies for the movement. I'm not sure where they want to go. Guys, you have the entire... You've got the whole dam to walk around. I've been sitting here peacefully the whole morning before you even got here. And I know that this is your land, but we also have to share it because I live here too. So if you can walk another way around so I don't have to move a car because if I start the car, you're going to shake your head. And Anyways, this is just how it goes with elephants. Thank you very much. He's listened to me. Not really. I don't think you can understand me. I think you can definitely understand my tone, though. <laughs> Yeah, no, they, oh my goodness, apologies, you might, I might be in your shot in a minute. I don't think I can lay any flatter. Sorry, okay, what I'll do is I'll shuffle around like this. But they are going straight into the eco-training camp now, where they will continue to eat all of the trees and pull branches, which I'll have to pick up a bit later. It seems like quite the day for elephants around water holes. Now there's a really nice breeze coming in. I mentioned it earlier, but it's picked up. I don't know if you can hear it, but that's a good thing because it's gonna keep cats like these cool. And I wonder if they just, they can see the buffalo. The buffalo are everywhere behind us. And I wonder if they just know where the buffalo are. They're just going to bide their time. They're waiting until there's no elephants in sight. And of course, the buffalo, what happened there was, I think it was a male buffalo, didn't go to the water, came round and either caught the smell of the lions or the sight of the lions. I'm not sure what. These predators will smell. And buffalo do have keen senses, good eyes, good ears, and good no nostrils. So one buffalo was alerted to the fact that there's predators here, reacted, which caused a complete domino effect amongst the buffalo to run, panic. And then, of course, it caused a reaction from the elephants. I'm not entirely sure if the elephants knew what they were reacting at, but they reacted. And I think the lions are just waiting. They know exactly where the buffalo are and they're going to follow them. They'll possibly wait till it gets a little bit cooler. Who knows? It depends how hungry they really are. Right now, they look very snoozy. By this afternoon, it could be the Talamatis that are on this buffalo herd. I don't know. I don't want to leave the Inkahomas. I'm very torn because I was hoping they would get up and either go for a drink or go after the buffalo. But of course, they've done neither. And the Talamatis are not too far away, but I don't know if we have enough time now to race round and call ourselves into that side down. The Talamatis are here for a reason. I think both prides are aware of the presence of the four new boys, as I mentioned, and I think that both of them are aware of each other. And they're just trying to navigate around one another right now. Because they both know that they've got cubs and four new boys are a huge threat. And most of the cubs in the Inkohoma Pride are much older, but it's still a very scary time for a pride to know that there's a potential takeover on the horizon. I wonder what would have happened if that buffalo did not somehow sense that the Inkohumas were here. Dr. Rocky Balboa? <laughs> 
Now that's some name. <laughs> I love it. You're asking, do lions purr? And believe it or not, lions cannot. They're in the Panthera genus, along with the tiger, the jaguar, the leopard, and the snow leopard. And these are known as the big cats. That's a sort of common name for the Panthera genus. And they have a really specialized voice box. And it's made of cartilage. It's non-ossified, which means it's not covered in bone. And that allows the voice box to vibrate. Cartilage is a really sort of flexible material. It's very resistant to disease, especially in marine life, and it's very flexible and it's not dense, nowhere near as dense as bone. And therefore, it will move in the larynx, it will vibrate, and that causes them to have a fantastic projection of sound. That's how lions are able to roar, leopards are able to saw. It's very loud sounds, raspy and hoarse. And of course, it's the main point in their territorial behavior and communications, intraspecific wise. Now, cheetahs, on the other hand, they cannot roar, they can not saw and that's because their voice box is different so cheetahs are known as the lesser cats they're not part of the panthera genus and they can purr it's very unusual when you hear a cheetah purr it's quite surprising and this is because their voice box is partially ossified it doesn't vibrate it doesn't project sound like the panthera genus does so lions cannot purr i'm afraid they do make soft contact calls when they need to communicate with one another, but it's definitely not classified as purring. And it's all due to a special bone in cheetahs called the hyoid bone that allows them to make this purring sound but prevents them from roaring. So we're going to sit here a little bit longer and see if our sleepy cats decide to move. So it seems like the water holes at all the different locations have been very productive this morning. It is turning into quite a toasty day and we decided to come visit one of the water holes on our eastern boundary and found three or four beautiful elephant bulls just drinking and covering themselves in mud. You can see the one on screen there is quite a big bull and he's got really nice tusks on him as well. So if, if you have a look at the back, you'll see it's really shiny. So that's where he flicked the mud onto his back. On a warm day like today, you'll see a lot of different animals coming down to the water. We've actually spotted quite a large herd of impalas off to our right or off to our left here. And I think they're just waiting for the elephants to move and then they'll, they'll go down. But this, uh, there isn't much water left here. Bloom. Do elephant tusks ever grow back? No. Once, uh, once the tusk has been broken, and also depends where it breaks, but it, it won't grow back. It'll keep breaking. Oh, sorry, keep breaking. It'll keep growing. Um, but it's it's pretty much a tooth. It's just a, a modified tooth. So if they lose that tusk, um, it will, yeah, you know, it won't grow back. Unfortunately, I guess if it's a really bad break, um, close to the nerve ending, then it's then it's done. But if it's um, closer to the tip, you often see that where the the tips of the tusks might be blunt um, and they lose the the ends just because of wear and tear um, but yeah then it keeps growing but uh, they'll have that blunt tip his his tusks are very symmetrical he's just shaking his head the impalas have slowly started coming down the bank here and there's also a woolly necked stalk next to him in the water there just to his left
There you can see the impalas coming into the frame. Stuck in bed. Do elephants ever get stuck in the mud? There is a possibility, yes. I'd say the larger elephants, it would be a lot easier for them to get out of the mud if they had to get stuck. But if, say, it was a, a big herd of elephants and there were youngsters around, then there's a good chance that, that they might get stuck if, it's, uh, if there wasn't a lot of water around and it's really deep mud then yes, there, there is a chance that that might happen. We see it with the antelopes um, every now and again and uh, unfortunately there's nothing we can do and that's predators will move in and they'll try and get them out of the mud. Hyenas, we've seen hyenas getting them out of the mud and then it's like a free meal for them. But if a, an elephant calf had to get stuck in the mud, um, the mother and you know the other elephants would definitely try and help it out. But in general, I'd say these these big guys, um, I don't think they'd get stuck that easily. Right, we're going to loop around, just see if we can get another view. If the threaded animals that would not get stuck in the mud are these elands here. I mean, they're very strong, very agile, as much as they look very big but they have been known to jump very high. And even if things will just go drink in very shallow water points. And it's such a huge herd of elands that I got here. Earlier, you saw Timothy, her lions that were devouring a wildebeest. So what he's saying, the migration is still on in the Mara, but currently the huger or the big herds are south of the Mara and north of Serengeti. With the whole composition of the migration, apart from the wildebeests and the zebras, elands also come in play. The greyish ones you see there, the big one, especially that one there in the middle, that is a male. And males of the elands are huge. They don't come in the middle of your screen. Look at him. Massive, and I would guess. He is the dominant male in this particular herd. Feeding as they move, you saw earlier with the giraffes that were not feeding, or they had just stopped, and they were chewing cud. But elands have that advantage. If you look below their necks, they've got that huge muscle that we call a dewlap and the dewlap helps them to thermoregulate and to maintain the temperatures down. So even in the mid heat of the day, they'll be comfortable out there grazing and browsing at the same time. Most herbivores at time like now will slow down and look for shades <clears throat> or shelters in areas that are not out in the open. Zebras tagging along with them. The beautiful scenery. So that backdrop there is where the oral escarpment ends. And as you go further the other direction, you'll be going to the Serengeti National Park. So these zebras are catching up with the elands for the one obvious reason safety numbers as much as the both different species as I spend a few more minutes where I am. Beautiful, so we're still in this position of a Tlalamba. Um, and then it's already a wind picking up here. So it's gonna be like this, I think, the whole day wind was predicted so it's going to be a little wind later on and 
that's gonna be probably how it's gonna be like the whole entire day. And she hasn't, I know she was looking around so much, but this has been, you know, time of the cats when, you know, they feel comfortable and there's nothing bother them too much. And so all they do is take it easy. And then especially they kill it safe up in the trees and then nothing bother them really. And it hasn't been any sign of another leopard around here that she would worry about. Because if that's a case, then of course there's a lot of her stealing from one another. The strongest always take it from the weakest one from the same species. But Princess Lalamba, she's machinery, so she well known of you know hunt successfully. Even though sometimes you know was a few times it was a little mistake that she didn't actually host the prey up in the trees and uh, get stolen. And then now she learned a lot that is so important for her to put the prey up in the trees that she don't have to worry about hyena and the lions and wild dogs and everything. The only the reason that, you know, a lot of time they lost their prey to a hyena is so because they are you know, male leopard, you know, weighs sometimes more than hyena can, but the hyena, they're built with very strong muscle jaws. And of course, that case, look at this, looks like she heard me saying like, no, you know, I also have my jaws pretty sharp and they're all teeth showing up there. You know, it could be this is the sign where maybe she will stood up for us. Annette, I agree with you, you know, you know, it's it's so special, more especially sitting with a Tlalamba this, uh, you know, in this kind of morning of the day. And then she's still doing her best, chilling out, painting. Well, she's actually not bad compared to the line, so she's not actually sleepy. And you can see that. She's enjoying the shade, but the head up. It's probably that then she might actually, maybe sometimes, go up into that tree there to feed it later on. I wonder how many carcasses Tlalamba has hanging in the trees these days. She's quite the huntress and a scavenger. It was highly amusing when she had two kills in separate trees the other day. With two prides of lion, lions on the property, a mega herd of buffalo, elephants everywhere, and Tlalamba. I'm not sure about the other leopards. I know there's a female on Torchwood that I think might be Tandy. But Shadulu could be around. There's a lot of predators and animals that could loosely be classified as part of the Big Five on Juma, which is a really small game reserve. Stuck in bed, one of my favourites. Good to hear from you. You're asking a tricky question, though. Do I have a favourite lioness? <laughs> I've seen them all go through different things. Amber Eyes is very, very iconic and I've seen her go through struggles, especially with raising offspring. I've seen Purple Eye have a severe injury and come through it, bounce back. I've seen Chilla raise her first litter and we found those cubs. It was BK and I, wasn't it? We found those cubs very, very early on, far too young than we normally would have, and it was complete coincidence. We just followed a lioness and she took us to four little tiny bundles of joy. Ridge knows she was the first to have a litter during my time here, bringing up those two fantastic boys. Oh, I feel something for them all, but I think if since you're putting me under pressure, stuck in bed, I would probably choose Amber. 
Ach, they're all so wonderful. The Inkahuma Pride is an incredible pride and they've gone through a lot in the past. They've suffered great loss. It's not been easy for them and of course they've now done so well by producing so many cups. They're thriving. They've lost some but they've managed to hold on to most of them and of course the cubs got mange and mange can really really severely impact a pride but they've came through it some of the cubs are badly scarred but these cubs will be absolutely fine if it's just scarring they really will be fine they're nowhere near as bad as the sticks pride were they were heavily heavily impacted by mange and since summer is really just around the corner, the rains are about to come to flush everything out. The grass is about to grow. Insects are about to multiply by millions. And a lot of the antelope species are going to have their young. So I can assure you all of these cubs will be absolutely fine. Normally with the summer rains, it flushes out mange. It's very good for the animal's skin. And the nutritional content of the prey that they eat from buffalo to zebra to impala, lions absolutely eat impala, improves. And therefore, the lion's condition improves. Consultant detective, you're throwing a spanner in the works here for me. Purple eyes, your favorite. Oh. I know, she's one of mine too. I think purple eye and amber eyes are right up there just because maybe I've spent the most time with them. And I'm just really proud of this pride. I really don't think it's easy to be a pride of lions navigating the landscape here. You've got enemies around the corner, you've got other predators. I don't think it's easy, but Jess, consultant detective Purple Eye is one of my favorites too. They're very interested now. I wonder what's in store for this afternoon. What a morning. Apologies for not showing you the cheetah, but we have had an incredible drive. And it's really important that I let you all know from BK and I and the rest of the team across the board that we really do appreciate you jumping on board. You are what makes this. Thank you for your comments and questions and please jump on board this afternoon. See you then. This program features live coverage of an African safari 